So I grew up in San Antonio, but my father's side of the family are from Jordanton, Pleasanton and Christine areas, about 30 miles south of San Antonio. And my mother's side of the family are from El Paso, West Texas area. But they have some stories from being around these areas, but here's a few of them from my family. So my father grew up in the Pleasant and Christine areas of Texas, which is about 20 to 30 miles south of San Antonio in the Texas brush country. The Texas brush country is a huge part of South Texas. It's not necessarily desert, but kind of a medium between the oak tree or cedar tree forests of the Texas hill country and the almost desert landscape of northern Mexico. Miles of wide open ranch land with loads of thorn and mesquite trees, with some oak trees sprinkled in for good measure. Growing up, we'd go down and visit family members in that region, and when the sun would go down, I always felt creeped out by the area. There are some creeks there too that make you swear that you're in Louisiana swamps, with large trees hanging over the creek beds, covered in Spanish moss and giving the areas a very creepy vibe, especially at night. It's well known too that there are now lots of wild chile pequin plants along lots of rivers and creeks in this area because when Santa Ana's army were making their way to San Antonio before the Battle of Alamo, the soldiers had with them chile pequin peppers to make salsa and add spiciness to their foods when they would make camp. And naturally, lots of the soldiers would drop excrement along the creeks and the seeds of the peppers would find their way into the soil and begin sprouting the pepper plants. Anyway, one of my father's uncles claims that he saw a large winged humanoid bird with glowing eyes swoop down on he and one of his buddies while out at the lake known as Choke Canyon, fishing for catfish late into the night from the bank without a boat. The story goes that it was around 11 p.m. or so on a Friday night and my father's uncle Robert and his buddy Chester, the two men had decided to go fishing for catfish and drink some beers and enjoy the start of the weekend with a nice relaxing nighttime fishing trip to the lake, which was about 30 miles from the town that they lived. So Robert, having worked in construction and having worked that entire day, was feeling pretty sleepy and decided to nap in the truck while Chester stayed on the lake bank, listening to the radio and watching their fishing rods that were casted out into the water. Uncle Robert climbs into the driver's seat of his truck and falls asleep pretty much instantaneously. An hour or so goes by and he's rudely awoken by Chester, who is screaming and pounding his fist on the passenger side of the truck, yelling like a madman for Robert to unlock the door to let him into the truck cabin. Robert unlocks the door and asks Chester, who is out of breath and panicking, what the heck is going on. Chester, clearly panicked and freaking out, says to start the truck up and for them to get the heck out of there. He said that he was chilling in his folding chair and had just caught a small catfish and had thrown it back into the water, had sat back down in his folding chair when he heard what sounded like a large bird flapping its wings behind him. He stood up and turned around and there was a, a bird-like humanoid, kind of like a large crane-like bird with a human face and beak-like mouth with glowing red eyes and a massive wingspan, something like 12 to 15 foot wingspan. He turned around and sees this thing flapping just behind and above him and appeared to be readying to land right where Chester was sitting. So at that, he legged it. These two were born and bred South Texan country boys, like my father, and had grown up in the brush country hunting birds, bobcats, alligators at that same lake, fishing and being common rural kids. So they had a lifetime of experiences with wildlife in that region and had never seen anything like it. Robert starts up the truck, and in the rearview mirror, illuminated in the red glow of the brake lights, Robert also sees the large bird-like creature land behind the truck and begin walking around the truck over to the passenger side. And just like it had been relayed to him, it was shaped like a man-sized crane with thin long legs that looked like it would stand at eye level with an average height man, and... It was the creepiest thing that he had ever seen. That was when Robert knew that Chester wasn't screwing around and he throws the truck into gear and just peels out of there. They end up getting back to Robert's place 
and Chester and he both decide to spend the night together, shotguns in hand, until morning, which is when they decide what to do next. They ended up going back the following day, armed to the tooth, to retrieve their fishing poles, folding chairs, and other fishing gear, and found the footprints of the whatever it was that they saw, still fresh, and in the sand around their fishing spot. This happened in the 70s, so it was before smartphones with cameras. When my father told me this story, I pictured something like a, a tall shoe bill, I guess, but there's really nothing like that in this part of the state. Maybe he just wanted to eat the fish that Chester had just caught. Following the incident, they would end up eventually going back to fish in the evenings, but they would always be sure to take firearms for protection from that point on. This next story happened to my great-grandparents on my father's mother's side. So they lived on their small cattle and livestock ranch in Christine, Texas for the last later decades of their lives. Christine is a super small town where everyone knows everyone and there's really no need to lock your doors when you leave or when you go to bed. My great-grandparents were the warmest people that you would ever meet. Always smiling, sharing humorous stories with friends and family. They'd take your coats or jackets when you'd enter their warm home and before hanging them up on their coat rack, they'd sneak a $20 bill into your pocket for you to find later. They were the kind of older couple who were always poking harmless jokes at each other in front of company to entertain you. Super charming and loving and always smiling and loving the life that they'd built for themselves. Visiting them was always a treat too because I grew up in the city and when we would visit on the weekend, my great-grandfather would take my younger brother and I around the ranch to see the animals and livestock, pet the horses, feed the goats and throw rocks into the stock pond. When we'd return to their house from seeing the ranch, my great-grandmother would have our favorite breakfast for dinner on the table. Fresh hash browns, farm-raised bacon and ham, homemade tortillas, mild and spicy salsas, and fried eggs. Oh, and coffee. Always with coffee, even if it was dinner time. And we loved it. Anyway, this story takes place during the 1960s. Not exactly sure on the year, but my great-grandparents were in their late 50s, and their children, my grandmother, were all grown up and had gotten married and moved out at this point. It was just the two of them living on the ranch. So, they were on their way home from visiting some family in the south side of San Antonio, about 70 miles away. They had lost track of time, so it was pretty late in the evening when they left. And they're driving back home to their ranch near Christine, Texas. And on their route, they have to drive over this wooden bridge that extends over a deep creek. I think sometime in the 1980s, a better road was paved into that town that no longer made it necessary to have to take this small dirt road and bridge from the Highway 16 to their small ranch. In fact, several years ago, the wooden bridge was torn down and a new bridge was built using steel and concrete. Spanish moss now hangs from the trees, which really makes it creepy. And from what I remember, this bridge is about 80 feet long from end to end. Due to the creek, it extends over being relatively wide as well. Underneath the bridge is a good 30 to 40 foot drop down to the creek bed. And for the most part, the creek is dry year round and really only sees water flow during rainstorms. But as my great grandparents are driving over this wooden bridge, their truck suddenly dies and comes to a stop near the middle of the bridge. My great-grandfather starts swearing up a storm because he's tired, it's late, and they're still about 10 miles from home. He maintains his truck better than most, and they had a full tank of gas. Even the headlights and the cabin lights shut off, so they were stuck there with only the moon bathing them and their surroundings in the soft moonlight. My great-grandfather was born in the brush country of South Texas, so there's not much that he hasn't seen out there. And in this situation, while most people might be a little bit intimidated to leave the safety of their vehicle, my great-grandfather was in his element out at night in what is essentially his backyard. Thinking that it has to be a battery connection that has come loose, my great-grandfather asks great-grandmother to hang tight, pops the hood and opens his door, stepping out into the cool night to check under the hood and hope to diagnose the issue. As he's struggling to see, fumbling with the battery connections under the hood, behind him, 
he hears the sound of clip-clops on the wooden bridge. It sounded like steps of a hoofed animal approaching him from behind. He turns around and lets his eyes adjust to the dim moonlight to see what's making that noise. Maybe it's a deer or a cow or a goat that has gotten loose from one of the other ranches in the area. Squinting, he looks down the bridge and sees what appears to be a, a very thin man, about five and a half feet tall, but with a set of very large ram horns on his head, walking upright, approaching him from the opposite end of the bridge. It's hoofed feet clip-clopping on the wooden bridge. That was what was making the sound, as it's steadily trotting towards him. A cold chill ran up my great-grandfather's spine, and he quickly shut the truck hood and hops back into the driver's seat, slamming shut the door behind him and locking it. My great-grandmother, confused by his sudden reactions, asks what's going on, and my great-grandfather points at the humanoid that is now slowly approaching their vehicle. She sees it and reacts with, what the heck is that, a goat? And they sat there, watching it approach them and their vehicle. They can now see that the horns on its head are very large, much larger than any ram or goat that they've ever seen but still cannot make out whether it was a ram or a goat's head or a, a human's head. It was about 20 feet from the front of their truck when it hunches over and begins walking on all fours of its cloven feet. They can only vaguely make out its features as it reaches their vehicle and begins circling them. My great-grandparents twisting and turning in their seats to watch it as it's bobbing its head up and down, pacing around their truck. It doesn't ever touch their truck. It only sort of slowly saunters around their vehicle, with the only sound in the night being its hooves clipping and clomping on the wooden bridge. And though it was dark and difficult to make out its exact features, they both agreed that it had the body of a bony, skinny man, but with the head of a goat. They both said that the creepiest part of the encounter was watching its large horns bobble around the front and rear of their truck, unsure if it was going to do anything to them and how it felt like an evil or demonic entity, that they could sense it not being a normal animal but a creature with evil intent it seemed. They hold their breath and don't know what to do and my great grandmother, being very Catholic, begins praying quietly under her breath. On its fifth or sixth time walking around their truck, it stands back up on its hind legs and meanders towards the opposite end of the bridge from which it came, eventually disappearing into the black night and leaving them in the truck, frightened and shaken. Weirdly too, a moment later, like clockwork, power is restored to their vehicle and my great-grandfather starts the truck up and peels out of there quickly, making a beeline for their home, where they rush into the house and grab firearms and... They spend the rest of the night locking all their doors and windows and they didn't get any sleep. When we were younger, my cousins and I would go and visit what we believed is the same bridge. I'm not sure if it was the actual bridge where this apparently took place, but it was very similar. And we would park our truck out there, get out and thrill ourselves by walking around out there after dark with flashlights and embrace the creepy ambience, armed with shotguns and rifles of course. My great-grandparents, they never saw anything like that creature again. But from that night onward, my great-grandfather always kept a loaded shotgun and a pistol in his truck with him. He never left without one, in fact. Now, this final one. My father, who was working as a construction contractor, had a work crew leave a job site in a panicked frenzy once because they apparently saw a Bigfoot-like creature in the creek behind the house that they were working on. It happened at a house that they were building a two-story garage at in the hill country, a little bit north of Spring Branch, Texas. I think it was around 1998. I was around nine years old. My brother was six at that time. The house that they were working on was on a piece of land way out between Blanco and Spring Branch. My father told us the work crew called him from a payphone at a gas station in Boulevard around noon and told him that they weren't going back to the job site until the following day because they were just too frightened. 
and also if it would be okay for them to bring some rifles and shotguns to keep in their trucks on that project until they were done. Mind you, they were a no-nonsense group of Mexican laborers, hard-working guys who would be at the job site from like 8am until sundown, busting their butts in the hot sun to earn a decent paycheck. But apparently, around lunchtime, after the crew had eaten and were resting in their trucks and in the shade of some of the trees, one of the guys went down to the creek behind the house to take a pee and explore the property a bit until it was time for them to get back to work. Behind the house was a sort of sloped wooded area that led down to a nice little shallow creek. And it was here where he said that he saw what he thought was a big brown bear peeking around a tree at him. Naturally, he got a bit spooked and startled, slowly backpedaling to the house up the hill, trying his best not to make any sudden movements and to not take his eyes off of this bear. As he was making his way back up the steep hill to the house job site to where the rest of the guys were, the bear ran from behind the tree and darted across the creek and into the woods on the other side. That was when the worker got a clear look at it and saw that it wasn't a bear. It ran upright on two legs and had the build of a large man covered in dark fur. When he saw it run and realized that it wasn't a bear, that's when he broke into a frenzied run to the rest of the guys, screaming at them to get into the trucks and for them to leave. They were a little thrown off by him, but he jumped into his truck and peeled off. And the rest of them, they saw how scared he was and so they quickly followed him in their own two trucks. I was on vacation with my family when I was about 14. I was in the pool which had a bar attached and I was casually talking to this group of British people. I want to say that it was all guys but I think that I remember a girl with them. Anyway, I started drinking a bit with them. The legal drinking age was 18 but the people who I was drinking with gave me an extra wristband that they had because apparently they were leaving the resort that day and wanted to give it to someone anyway. My parents didn't know about this, obviously, and neither of them knew that I was drinking. But they were clearly a lot older than me, and kept putting drink after drink in my hand. And I was ecstatic because I was, well, getting drunk in a pool in Cancun and out of sight from my mother. They started to try to convince me that one of the guys in the group was 15, and that I should talk to him because he liked me. But even then, I knew that he definitely wasn't 15. He also wasn't as old as the others who seemed to be in their late 30s. In hindsight, I'm thinking mid to late 20s. I was young though and just thought that they were joking around with me. But they kept telling me that he liked me and I should go hang out with him. I laughed it off the first time but they kept suggesting. Keep in mind this whole time my dad was in the same pool talking to his friend and he had his eyes on me for almost the whole time. My parents are very strict. He didn't know what I was drinking was alcoholic and the pool was big enough that you couldn't hear what was being said. At that point, I was totally wasted though and my first time actually getting seriously drunk like that. I don't even remember leaving the pool with this guy trying to tell me that he was 15 but apparently I was stupid enough to do this because I remember thinking that he was cute. The resort is huge, mind you, and I don't know how I don't remember walking through the whole thing and not remembering it. I often wonder what we actually spoke about. But the next thing that I do remember is walking and approaching a bus stop that was maybe a 10 minute walk from the resort. I know it was 10 minutes because my family and I often went to this bus stop to explore Cancun. He told me that I had a nice body and asked if I had ever had sex before. I just started laughing and he sat on the bus bench and pulled me onto his lap at this point. My world is spinning so I don't protest even though I remember thinking that I wanted to be back at the pool. It was then too that something absolutely beautiful happened. I threw up all over him. Remember, I'm on his lap at this point so it was like right in his face and on his chest and everything and I just kept throwing up too like the exorcist level projectile vomiting. He was extremely grossed out by this and I don't remember what was said but we ended up walking back to the resort and I never saw him again. 
I do remember feeling really embarrassed though, which is ridiculous in hindsight. I wobbled back to the pool area, covered in throw up, where my mum had called the police and her and my dad were freaking out. My mum's piercing voice sobered me up a bit because I remember these parts are a lot clearer, even though they're still a little bit hazy. But they saw how drunk I was and demanded to know what had happened, so I told them. Then they got furious. My mum was adamant on finding that guy or his friends who had all disappeared from the pool at this point. I didn't really see what the big deal was back then and why she wanted to find them. To this day, I think about what would have happened though if I hadn't thrown up like that and actually left with this guy. I was 5'2 and 14 years old and he was at least a foot taller than me and definitely not a minor. I remember when he was close to me with no one around and even in my extremely drunk state, I started to get a bit nervous. My parents, they took me to our hotel room and I spent hours in the bathtub just throwing up. My mom was furious, like completely livid. I wasn't too surprised at that because she yelled at me over trivial things all the time anyway. So was my dad though, which surprised me because he's always so easygoing and honestly probably would have been a bit amused at me being drunk, throwing up. Not in a cruel way, but because I was learning a lesson about alcohol that we all eventually do, right? He actually straight up told me that at some point too before this whole vacation. But now I know that his anger wasn't directed towards me. He was cursing about that guy. I was still throwing up in the bathtub and they had both went into the kitchen area to talk away from me, but I could vaguely hear my dad cursing terribly while speaking to my mum in our native language, and I was actually scared by this. I couldn't quite focus on his voice because I was legitimately drifting in and out of consciousness at that point, but I remember getting less scared and more just sad I guess because I felt like I had disappointed him. He never got mad like that towards me, but then again, I realized later that he wasn't actually angry at me, and he wasn't angry at the drinking either. He was angry at that scumbag. I do remember wondering why they were making such a big deal about it all, and it was only a few years later that I actually understood. Later on that day, because this all happened at like 2 in the afternoon, so I was at least cognizant by dinner time. I expected my mum to blow up at me over dinner when I was sober, as she usually does. That woman's like a life fuse, let me tell you, but they were both just kind of quiet and staring at me and didn't leave my side after that. I can't imagine what they were going through, knowing about the danger that I had been in just a few hours before this, staring at me like it was a miracle that I was even there anymore. I was young and stupid, but I would like to give my deep thanks and gratitude to Beer for constantly annoying my stomach to the point of projectile vomiting. Without it, I honestly don't even know if I'd be here. One of my mum's friends rented an apartment, but she was away at college, so she allowed my mum and another one of her friends to live there while she was gone. My mum and this other friend lived in the upstairs apartment along with my mum's one-year-old baby, my older brother. My mum was a teen mum, so would have been about 17 years old. The kitchen walls were made of tin, so it was always freezing cold. But they always felt uncomfortable around that side of the apartment too. There were some strange things that they just couldn't explain. Like, one time they saw their college friend's room looked like it was on fire... It was all lit up really strange and was glowing unlike any light would create. They would hear footsteps coming up the stairs to the house and called the police five or six times to check the apartment. The police would come, check the apartment, and never really found anything. My mum and her friend began to suspect that it was a ghost, so they would read the Bible out loud, which made the footsteps stop so they could finally get some sleep. But one night, my mum's friend called her brother who happened to be a sheriff in a nearby town. Her brother brought a buddy over and they came over to check the apartment following one of those episodes of footsteps. And they found that the ex-boyfriend of the friend who was living at college had been living in the attic the whole time. They think that he'd been climbing a tree into their college friend's bedroom and getting up into the attic from her closet. 
My mom somewhat knew this guy and she had met him before and knew who he was, but they were just acquaintances because apparently he reacted inappropriately in social situations and was hard to connect with. After my mom had moved out of the apartment and into a new one, he once came to visit my mom's new house along with the college friend. After he had left, my mom had discovered that while he was over at her house, he had rearranged my brother's furniture in really strange ways. Everything from his bed to his toy box was completely changed. Several years later, he apparently murdered an old lady by shoving her down some stairs in a shopping cart and it was discovered that he had schizophrenia. So, he'd been living in that attic for the entire six months that my mum had lived there. It's possible that he'd been watching them, my brother as well, but they wouldn't have known the information since they never saw him. He had an entire room set up in the attic too. My mum also believes that the house also had some kind of spirit there because of the freezing rooms, uneasy feelings, biblical words having an impact, and the unexplainable situations like the glowing room. She also says that their downstairs neighbor had children who she hated and never wanted to raise. She would often neglect the kids and lock them in their bedrooms from the outside, so it's possible the entire house just had some residual negative energy from all of the absolute shenanigans. Who really knows? Thankfully, after that, the whole situation just sort of sorted itself out, which my mum was very thankful for. But it is creepy to think about someone like that just living in your house and you're completely unaware that they're there. When I was a teenager, me and my friends, we used to quite frequently go to abandoned buildings of different sorts. This hobby kind of got worn out for me personally, but when I was at my first or second year of university, I noticed a, a weird, not too big, abandoned building very close to my uni. My uni is located pretty much downtown. The place that we are talking about is very crowded and filled with elite property, stores, and historical buildings. So it was sort of weird seeing the building just standing there in some sort of a yard between other buildings. And so I grabbed my friends, there were four of us, and we decided to check it out. We came there late at night so there would not be more eyes than necessary. It was also winter. We grabbed our tools and broke a lock to one of the entrances, but it was a dead-endish sort of small room. It was pretty creepy with a wheelchair standing there. We then found another door though to the building. It was locked more heavily this time. We couldn't break the lock itself, so we somehow managed to make a big hole in the door so that everyone could just climb in there. It was very loud, obviously, so after we had done it, we decided to wait a bit before going in, just in case someone called the cops on us. After an hour spent at the nearby McDonald's, we proudly, with how we handled that super locked door that seemed to haven't been opened for years, decided to go in. The building felt empty and damaged. There wasn't really much stuff there besides concrete walls and a lot of trash, which we thought was old. There was no light in there at all. Every window was locked too. It's sort of creepy to think back on this decision, but the first thing that we decided to do is to go to the attic, all of us. It was pretty much more of the same though. A lot of trash, some graffiti, and generally nothing too interesting. Then we decided to come back to the floor that we started from and check it out properly. And while we were there, for some reason, I guess being kind of creeped out from the atmosphere, just standing in the corridor, which allowed to overview two big halls, both of them were filled with trash. One of us decided to go across the hall. We could see him clearly with a flashlight to check out some sort of shack that was located in those piles of trash in the end of the hall. He looked inside and then rushed back to us very concerned. He said that there was apparently a body inside. We all thought that it was a dead person at first because the building was locked. And I mean, there was no way that there was someone living in there somehow. We honestly felt like someone died and nobody seemed to care. This discussion could not be continued though because we then actually saw someone coming at us. A mere silhouette at first, but 
We lost our minds from this, and we rushed into the door hole, which was not perfect for anyone to climb through it in such a rush. But while we were making it out, this person shouted something angry at us with a rather unsettling voice and was mad at us for breaking the door. We were terrified because of just how unexpected that was. We honestly believed that there could not have been anyone in a locked abandoned building like that that was out of use for years and partially damaged. I guess we just never thought to ourselves that maybe it was not the city that locked it but someone managed to privatize the locks. The guy himself was creepy too, living in absolute darkness like that, full of trash in an abandoned private hospital. Living in absolute darkness like that, full of trash in an abandoned private hospital. Afterwards, we tried to find out what that trash was, but it was the best guess that it was just trash. In the end, we got away and nobody was harmed, which we were thankful for, but it was a, a real wake-up call to be much more careful about doing this. So I'm currently staying in some friend's garage made into a temporary apartment until I get back on my feet. Right off the bat of moving in, I got weird vibes in it too. For the first couple of weeks, I kept having intense nightmares that were partially sleep paralysis where someone or something is in the garage with me, hiding in the corners watching me, then slithering around and peeking at me from below the side of my bed, or something coming up behind me and grabbing me. One specific window in the garage creeps me out the most though. It's not covered with anything, so if anyone was outside, they could just look in. And I can't see out due to the lights that I have on inside. My cat will often sit in the window and scratch at it as if she's trying to get out to something outside. Which is weird for her because she's freaked out by being outside. Is a bit of a big wimpy indoor pampered baby, so the only conclusion that I have is that there's something out there that she's trying to get at. One day a couple of weeks ago, I was listening to music on my headphones. I had my laptop open, had nothing but the main screen on it. I was dancing around vibing to the music when I suddenly heard a weird deep sound somewhere in the garage with me when the song that I had on was ending and I could slightly hear my surroundings again. I turned around and on my laptop the screen was suddenly jumbled and glitchy looking and then started showing or flashing these weird symbols that didn't look familiar at all. I ripped my headphones off and this terrifying sound was playing from my laptop, like this deep demonic voice that sounded like it was speaking backwards was playing. It was honestly the scariest thing that I've ever heard in my life and I love spooky stuff but this was like the type of evil voice that I've heard only in absolute worst nightmares. It sort of resembled the song Masked Ball from the Eyes Wide Shut soundtrack if you've heard it, but way deeper and more evil and creepy sounding. The strange glitchy symbols kept flashing and changing on the screen while this weird backwards voice was speaking through my laptop. I tried to shut it off or hit escape, but nothing was working. So I finally slammed it shut and immediately had a really bad panic attack. I ran inside to my friend's house and I told them what had happened while I had an absolute meltdown. I made them go back into the garage with me and inspect the laptop and the plugins and everything so we could try to explain why it happened. But in the end, we couldn't find an answer. What's even weirder though is that we all noticed that my laptop was actually still on mute from when I muted it like a couple of days earlier, making it even more strange that I was hearing this coming from my laptop speakers. I mean, it just should not have been possible, like at all. I still have no idea what happened or why. I would love to chalk it up to some weird technological glitch, but there's just no way. There was absolutely nothing happening on my laptop at all and it was muted. I don't have schizophrenia and I'm not crazy or anything. Like, I swear on my life that this happened as well and it wasn't a hallucination or something. I really wish that I had a logical explanation for it too because it would ease my mind a bit. 
It messed me up pretty bad for a while though. And the night after it happened, I spent hours just outside smoking cigarettes, staring at the garage from afar, terrified to even go in and sleep. I still have regular nightmares and sleep paralysis of something being in there with me, but to be honest, I really don't want to count on that as paranormal or anything. So, I guess my question for all of you guys is, does anyone know how or why my laptop would suddenly start flashing glitchy symbols and a backwards demonic voice would start speaking through the muted speakers like that? If you have an answer, then please do let me know because, like I said, it would ease my mind considerably. So I started meditating about five years ago. I had done it before, but not as deep as I was going. I don't know if it was the technique or what, but the method that I was doing was training me to go longer and longer without a single thought. It was simply sit down and feel your body. That was it. If you have a thought, let it go and focus on the feeling of your body. So, longer and longer I would go without a thought over the coming months. I did this for sleep. I've always had insomnia since I was in middle school. And it worked. I was finally beginning to get to sleep on my own. I usually had to take an OTC sleeping pill. But something started to happen the longer that this would go on. Over time, as I would meditate, I would start to hear sounds... The TV would start clicking, almost as if it would if it was cold and then got hot. Same with the knocks in the walls. The knocks would sound like an old house readjusting to different temperatures. That's what the sounds sounded like anyway. No big deal, right? Just a click in the TV or a creak in the walls. But the more I meditated, day after day, the more these sounds would pick up in activity and... I noticed that I wasn't hearing them when I wasn't meditating. Maybe once a day I would hear the sounds, so the sounds seemed to be related to my meditations themselves. But I kept meditating. I mean, it was weird, but it wasn't anything distressing. But as the days went by, I would put myself into such a deep state that when I heard a sound, I would jump out of my state real quick like you would if somebody jump scared you and they seem to be getting louder now too. It was around this time that a new phenomenon started happening as well. I started having involuntary movements, I guess you could call them. Now, when I was in that state of no thought, I had sound activity picking up to jump scare me, and now my arms and legs would randomly jerk, and again, it seemed to only happen when I meditated. At first, the involuntary movement was light, but as time would go on, my arms, legs, and even head would jerk more and more violently. And the weird thing was that all of this stuff would affect my meditation and immediately take me out of a state that I had cultivated myself. But I kept meditating daily, and the next thing that started happening was I would start to realize the knocks on the wall weren't the only sounds that I was hearing. I was also hearing furniture moving in the other room. Now, this activity was not only happening when I meditated, but all the time when I was alone in my house. It got so bad one day that I was taking a shower and I thought that I heard someone break into my house. It honestly sounded like somebody had kicked my front door open. Obviously, I get out of the shower to look, but nothing. It got to the point where I was hearing all of these noises all the time that I couldn't tell if somebody else was in the house or not. The worst of all, the scariest part was that it would also pick up its activity when I would read. But what I mean is that it would make a noise the exact time when I would get into the book, effectively preventing me from being able to read. It felt extremely creepy, like there was a, a ghost deliberately tormenting me that was able to tell when my mind would get into any sort of state like this. It felt like a, a conscious entity that was sent to torment me and prevent me from going any further or any deeper into a meditative state. 
It also seemed to purposefully try to make me feel like somebody was in the house when I was alone. There was also an incident where I heard this super strange noise in the middle of the living room and my cat jumped almost out of her skin. She was so spooked. And that confirmed to me that it wasn't all in my head. Now, this activity never happened when I had somebody else in the house with me. This caused me so much despair and distress that I began to drink as alcohol was the only thing that made it seem to stop in the end. And it's been five years since all of that. I'm now sober for a month and the first time being sober since this happened, when I started drinking because of all of this, I began to drink every night so that I could sleep and at least have a couple of hours every day to be free from the torment. But I'm ready to start practicing spirituality again and meditating, but I have to know what all of that activity and torment was all about. What it was, what caused it, and how to prevent it going forward. So please, this is real, and the scariest part about all of this is that most people think it's not. I experienced something that should be impossible, so... I had no clue who to talk about it to or how to solve it. I was very alone and trapped with this thing that really just shouldn't exist according to, well, science and everything, but if you have any idea about what I should do, then do let me know because I want to move forward with my life and I want to just have this all over and done with. My aunt and uncle's house was in a small desert town. They had about four acres of land and a good amount of space between neighbors. On the back of their property, there was a fenced-in area with a large shed and an old salvaged U-Haul moving truck. I was visiting for a couple of weeks one summer. My little cousin and I were about 10 or 12 at the time. And one morning, we were roaming the property by ourselves. The adults were all out running errands. We ended up walking between the fence and the old moving truck. We were on the passenger side of the truck, walking from the back towards the front, when all of a sudden, my cousin just froze. The hairs on the back of my neck stood instantly. He didn't make a noise and just pointed at the side mirror. In the reflection, we could see a man sitting in the driver's seat. His face was caked in dirt and blood. He was moving around quickly and at one point he ducked out of our view. But we instantly turned and sprinted back to the house. We locked all the doors and called the cops and family. We were freaking out, obviously, running from room to room, looking out the windows, brandishing baseball bats, you name it. The police and family showed up after about 15 to 20 minutes. They searched all over, but they never found the man. They found the fence was bent down where he must have climbed over it. There was blood and dirt smeared all over the driver's seat of the truck. He must have been trying to steal it because the ignition wires were pulled out like he was trying to hotwire it. No explanation for the blood and nothing happened after that. My cousin and I had nightmares for the next few nights just thinking about it but that was really about it. The obvious bit is that he was a guy that was trying to steal the car but why he was caked in blood like that? No one still has any idea as to why that was the case. My house has always been a, a hotspot for strange things. They've been happening for 19 years now. A few family members died in the house when I was like two or three, and me and my mum have seen multiple apparitions. The earliest event that I remember was when my uncle came to visit when I was like 10. He's a diehard skeptic, taking every possible opportunity to explain away any possible event. While I was watching Ghost Adventures with my grandmother, he walked into the room talking about how it was unrealistic and obviously fake. My grandmother asked him why and he said because ghosts don't exist. He then walked over to the dinner table and... A bulb from the light over the table just exploded. He had just replaced all the bulbs a couple of hours earlier too and there were three other bulbs that were completely fine. It was only the bulb closest to his head, which was weird. 
Another time, my sister had a nightmare, so I was laying on her bed next to her, comforting her. A couple of hours later, I saw a woman walk down the hallway, stop at the door, lock eyes with me, then turn and walk into the bathroom next to the room. Now, usually I would be able to see the light turn on, or at least see the light from under the door, especially at 3am, but I didn't. I asked my family the next day if they went to the bathroom by my room, and they didn't. It isn't the primary bathroom, since they have one in their room, and one in a hall closer to the family room downstairs as well. So, it would be strange of anyone to walk to the second floor to use my bathroom when there are two bathrooms much closer to everybody else. But the next one happens once every two or three years. So, the first time it happened, I was 14 during the summer, before my freshman year of high school. I had been staying up late and sleeping in, as one typically does during the summers. I remember watching Lilo and Stitch and seeing the shadow of a small child standing outside of my door. But when I cautiously said hello, it just ran off. I remember a chill running down my spine and every part of my being telling me not to follow it. I've always had strong intuition, so I listened and I just continued watching my movie. An hour or so later, I heard a loud bang. I called out to see if one of my family members dropped something, receiving no response, and against my better judgment, I walked downstairs to their rooms, but they were all asleep. Since I was downstairs, I took the opportunity to grab some snacks, and standing at the back corner of the kitchen was that same little boy. I flipped the light on, seeing him just disappear. At that... I booked it out of that kitchen, leaving the light on and going back upstairs. The next morning, and by morning I mean at around 2pm, I was making some eggs and my dad asked if I had scratched my leg or something. I said no and I looked at my leg to see what he was talking about. And on the back of my leg, there was a long scratch with a bit of dried blood around it. It spanned about 12 centimeters just above my ankle, running pretty much vertically at a bit of an angle. It was at that that we saged and salted the house that night. We repeated that too whenever I would see it. It came back last month at about 4am while I was watching Hamilton. I grabbed the jar of salt and my obsidian and evil eye necklace from my closet and drew a line of salt in front of my door and on my windowsill. I saged the house again the next morning and that was that. I know this must sound weird to other people but... Honestly, when you've lived with something like this for years, I guess it's just something that you eventually get used to. So my sisters and I have years of stories from this one kid that we babysat for over the years. The first event happened when the kid, his name was Liam, was maybe three or four years old. I was cooking for him in the basement. It was an old house, a former estate from the late 1800s, so the kitchen was in the basement, designed for the servants with a dumb waiter, etc. I heard some movement upstairs though, like people had let themselves in and were having a conversation and setting things down. The parents weren't supposed to be back for like another few hours. Not a big deal though. The voices didn't sound threatening, like women laughing and chatting. So I asked Liam if there's a maid or cleaning service that ever stops by, thinking that the parents may have forgotten to mention it. He then casually replies, No, we hear voices sometimes, but mummy and daddy say not to talk about it. I checked. No one was upstairs, and the front door was closed. But there was also the time that he went into a sudden trance while repeating some guy's name over and over after fixating on an old painting and was rolling around on the floor for a minute with the whites of his eyes showing, then snapped out of it and had no memory or was confused why I seemed so panicked and worried about him. I later told his parents thinking that it's an obvious health issue or was a possible seizure or whatever, but they just sort of chuckled and said that they would mention it to their therapist. That and the reoccurring night terrors that Liam would always have if he slept in one particular room. It happened a couple of times to him, once to his friend, but 
In both cases, it was a sort of sudden blood-curdling scream coming from the kid in the room. I remember racing upstairs to find his friend once as she was hyperventilating, upright in bed and just kept repeating, there was a man in the room, there was a man in the room. Liam also was a sleepwalker. When he did sleepwalk with me, it also started with a blood-curdling scream and him sprinting down the stairs to find me, seeming terrified but still definitely asleep and not aware of his surroundings, mumbling about a man. I was able to guide him back to bed without waking him while still calming him down in his sleepwalk state. I felt guilty telling the kids that it was just a bad dream or a nightmare when I believed that they did see something, but I just didn't know what else to do or say. And there are many other stories over the course of 10 plus years between me and my sisters working with this family as their go-to house or babysitter. And then the usual lights and electronics turning on or off suddenly, objects falling off of shelves inexplicably when no one is in the room, doors slamming shut and locking by themselves. My sister swears that she saw a woman walk through the room out of the corner of her eye once before the TV turned on in the next room. Liam also has an early phase of frequently referencing the dead people. My friend, who used to also babysit for them, refused to even be in the house after the kids went to sleep because she hated it so much. She'd tell Liam that she'd be on the front porch if he needed anything, then would sit outside and read a book until the parents returned. Even if it was freezing, she preferred it to being in the house as the only awake person at night. It didn't help too that the house was like a mile down a dirt road, in the woods past a swamp and old overgrown tennis courts, with coyotes howling in the distance even. The property also had no cell service and the house landlines were usually dead. The house was exclusively decorated with antiques and creepy sort of sexual art and taxidermied critters. The parents also reminded me of a couple out of Eyes Wise Shut and seemed, I'm pretty sure, were into occult practices. There's a famous hippie New Age Center in my town that they were involved in. Oh, and uh, the infamous Alistair Crowley himself used to hang out on the estate back in the day, apparently. And there's even a documented story about him performing rituals on the edge of the estate. I learned about this history years after we stopped babysitting for them, obviously. So, overall... It was a, a really scary home to babysit in, but they paid well, especially when they'd come home drunk at like four in the morning. They'd just hand us a wad of cash or sometimes would forget that they paid and pay again on the next day even. And the kid, well, he was sweet when he wasn't saying creepy things. So in the end, I would say that it was worth it. For a bit of background, I live in an area known as the Greater Cincinnati area. We're technically in Kentucky, but if you were to go to your local airport and buy a ticket to fly into Cincinnati, you'd land closer to my house than Ohio. It's a fairly socio-economically diverse area too, with a lot of history connected to the Civil War and history connected to various native tribes like the Iroquois, Cherokee, and Shawnee but I don't think that there were ever heavy population centers here. Mostly the land south of the river was used as hunting land, I think. Now, I have a number of personal paranormal stories from living here, and there are a number of well-known paranormal locations within this range. Bobby Mackey's, Waverly Hills, Maysville Slave House, etc. But the story that I'm writing about today has me perplexed. Maybe because I have not experienced it firsthand, and neither have any of the adults that I've spoken to. Now, if you're the type of person who's willing to dismiss this based on the ages of the witnesses, I can't blame you. I'm guilty of it from time to time as well, but hear me out. Teenagers, being the only witnesses, are actually part of what has me telling this story, and could be a part of something bigger going on. What I've learned is that, as adults, we need to be able to read the kids around us. They're poker players without the time to perfect their bluffs, I guess. And what I wrote off at first became more alarming as I grew more familiar with these kids and started to recognize their normal personalities and their tells. So, on to the story now. My son met some kids at a new school who lived in a local trailer park. 
Not a stereotypical one, it's actually a nice one going off its looks. After getting to know them at school, he started wanting to hang out at their houses. The trailer park has a basketball park, a play park, and a system of streets that offer ample ability for kids to play in the street without worrying about the traffic flow. Not to mention having plenty of open fields the kids use for various sports and games. Safe to say, my son loved the idea of hanging out in this trailer park. After a while, we became regular fixtures there. Him more so than me. I was just the ride, really. He hung out there. I would even get to the point that I would take some of my son's friends on trips, just so that he could have experiences with his friends that weren't confined to this one area. Life experiences and a constant attempt at maintaining balance is a big part of my parenting style. And it was then that I started hearing these stories, though. At first, I would only hear them as the kids exchanged the stories with one another while in my car, but after a while, I became the cool dad, probably because of the trips, and I would be occasionally included in their conversations, and I ended up getting the full rundown of what was going on in this trailer park. In addition to all of the features that I mentioned before, this park also has a small wooded area that occupies about an acre of land between two trailers in one of the bends in the road and thins out to only a few feet as it extends about a quarter of a mile behind the trailers running along that road. This is on the road closest to the interstate, so I've always assumed the wooded area was left to help dampen the noise coming from it. One of my son's best friends, the only kid he's still allowed to associate with, his name was Kevin, lives in one of the two trailers that flank this wooded area, a fact that comes into play later. So as you can probably imagine, the kids will venture into this area to explore it. And this is where the oddities start to happen. I've been told stories of dark figures standing at a distance, featureless entities that vanish before these kids' eyes. I've heard of stories of sounds coming from this area, everything from growls to wails, and even various forms of mimicry. Different stories have it sounding like a, a friend, a parent, unknown little girl, baby, etc. Almost always beckoning the kid to come into the wooded area. Some of them have even shown me red marks and scratches that they've gotten. Oddly enough as well, usually on what one could say is the weak link of the group that ventured into the woods on a given occasion. Starting mostly with the physically weaker kid, but also if a kid goes into the woods whilst under some sort of emotional distress as well. They call it a skinwalker, but I'm guessing that that's just because it's the creature of the moment for the time. Originally, I was hearing these stories from a single group of kids, a fairly large group, but still one you could figure would be able to get their story straight. But over time, the group fell out of friendship. Certain members took issues with other members and went from friends to enemies. All a bunch of teenage drama, really, that I would have preferred to avoid. But it's an odd situation when I had to be there to drive my son. Hearing all of this when I did drive him afforded me the ability to give my son some life lessons, and that part was cool. Some of these issues didn't involve my son directly though, so he would still consider both sides of a conflict a friend, and I would hear each talk about the wooded area with the same levels of fear and mystery as they had when they were hanging out every day, which is what started me looking at this with a real curiosity. Up until this point, I had viewed it as a just an urban legend type of thing, something that they may have believed, but was only born of collective imagination. But as I started considering everything around this place, Kevin told me a story about having seen the same type of tall, dark, featureless figure in the corner of his room. That really was a moment when I had a weird series of connections that were made in my mind. I started looking at everything that I knew about the place from my conversations with parents and other adults who lived there. There seemed to be a, I don't know, like a, a constant flow of darkness through that place. Brand new cars would require major repairs. Relationships that had spanned years without major issues would end badly shortly after moving into the trailer park. The people, specifically children, would become overly aggressive towards other people, even if it hadn't been in their character. Accidents resulting in injury grew more frequent, 
and it even reached the point where a 17 year old ended up stabbing a man over an issue with a small pet dog. Ultimately, that's why I'm sharing this too. That last part was all I or any other adult had seen. That seeming decaying of the society within the bounds of this random trailer park. But with the stories that I've heard and the ways that I've heard them, I've come to believe that something resides within that wooded area, unable to affect anything outside of those lines, never presenting itself in a way that quantifies it as something with which I'm familiar, but something that seems to cause a blanket of negativity to soak into the very lives of anyone that lives there. And so my question for you is, does anyone have any idea of what this type of thing could be? I can't think of anything that fits every issue that I've been told, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some of the high strangeness things that I've been told. It's late here and I'm starting to get tired, so I'll end here, but if you have some information, then I would genuinely like to hear it. My parents have told this story to me numerous times throughout my life, and both of them, and my older brother, corroborate this story in exact detail. They seem genuinely terrified of what happened, and they've told very few people about this experience. So, in the summer of 1990, my mom, 31, dad, 35, and brother, 15, attended an Aerosmith concert in Ohio. After the concert, the three of them were walking to the parking lot in a huge crowd of people. My parents were standing on one side of the street about to step off the curb when they saw two hooded figures across the street. By the time their foot hit the pavement, the figures were directly in front of them. They also seemed to float without feet and moved from one side of the street to the other in an instant. The next thing that they knew, they are standing alone, not in the exact same place that they were, with their arms outstretched from the elbow, palms facing up, and their hands and forearms are tingling. They made their way back to the car, and when they did, nobody else was around anymore. The parking lot was empty, except for their car, obviously. My brother was sitting on the bumper waiting for them and said that he had been waiting for them for about two hours. My parents have no recollection of what happened during that two hour period. My brother says that he was walking and he turned around and they were just gone. He went back to the car and waited. Two weeks after this incident, my mum finds out that she is pregnant with me and they believe that this may be the reason that they were approached. I personally have never experienced anything unexplainable like this but I do believe their story. I've never known them to make things up and they're not psychotic or anything. They believe this encounter was some kind of extraterrestrial being. I believe their experience was genuine, but I'm not certain that aliens are the explanation, but I'm also not ruling it out. This happened in a post-concert crowd with hundreds of people around, mind you, and... I'm wondering if anyone else has had a similar experience or any insight on what could have happened to them. For those of you who may be thinking that they were dosed, I agree that this is a strong possibility, but I'm not aware of any drug that can cause this. For those who may be thinking about a DNA test, I did ancestry and there wasn't anything crazy in the results. I've also had MRIs before and I have normal human anatomy. I don't think my mum got pregnant during this incident. She was already pregnant and just didn't know it yet, I guess. Anyway, it's a weird story, I know, but like I said, if you have any light to shed on it, then please do let me know. I don't consider myself a, a true believer, I guess, but because of my personal experiences... I do have a hard time completely discounting the idea of otherworldly beings interacting on our plane of existence. I've suffered from insomnia and sleep paralysis and the strangest dreams and nightmares. I'm a super light sleeper. I've always been scared of the dark and am 100% the type that turns lights off and sprints to my bed. My sleep paralysis is pretty typical, I guess. 
I'll wake up and feel this darkness and pressure and panic. I don't automatically realize that that's what it is. I usually think it's some sort of dark presence with malice attacking me at the time. I'll try to scream at it, banish it away like I've seen in the movies, etc. But when I come out of it, I can recognize that it's just sleep paralysis. That being said, there are other things that have happened revolving around my sleep that I can't rightly explain. There are a few instances that I can recall, but at the forefront of my mind was the experience at my grandfather's house. So I lived with my grandfather for almost a year at one point. For almost the entire time, everything was normal. But one night, as I was sleeping, I felt something touch my foot. It's so typical, right? Scary movie, but I swear that I felt something wrap around my ankle. I had a toddler and there was a cat in the house too, so I figured that it was just one of them on my leg. I'm not big on being touched while I sleep though, so I got a bit angry and shook it off. And that was when I felt my foot connect with something solid, kicking it, and I heard it hit the ground. And what happened next struck me with absolute terror. An ungodly yowl. Not like an angry cat, but like some sort of demon. I immediately sat up and saw some human-like woman crawling back and forth on the ground, looking extremely agitated. I scooted back against the headboard, looked at the window, and then back at the floor, but by that point, it was gone. When I checked the time, I saw that it was around 4 in the morning. I couldn't leave the bed before the sun came up because... Quite honestly, I was just way too scared to. When I spoke to my grandfather about it, he let me know that his mother-in-law used to live in that room and died of dementia. He said that she's apparently haunting the house and was probably the woman that I saw, based on my description. I didn't get along with her daughter, so I guess it kind of makes sense that she would want to scare me off. But it makes me sick even thinking about it now. Anyway, this stuff is really hard to talk about, but it's reassuring to know that others have had random scary experiences like mine too. I'll come back at some point and share more about the experiences that I had another time, but for now, thanks for listening. So the other day, I decided to take a nap after I got off work. I really don't nap often, maybe like twice a month if anything, and I've noticed that when I do nap, I can never fully let my mind shut off, so when I fall asleep, I'm never in an actual deep sleep. I feel like I'm somewhere between asleep and awake, I guess, still aware of my surroundings with my eyes closed, if that makes sense. Well, when I was napping on this particular day, I felt something crawl up on the edge of my bed, and it made its way over to my body. I was laying on my side and had a blanket up to my chin, so I couldn't see what it was, but it felt like a man, and at first I thought it was my husband, as he had gone to the gym, and I thought maybe he came back and was messing with me. But as its head got closer to mine, it kept making a, a loud breathing sound, and in my sleep I remember I could see my room, and I was able to barely take a peek at it, and it looked like a man wearing a white mask. It kind of reminded me of the Jason mask, but I couldn't really tell because my vision was like when you barely open your eyes and you can only see a little and it's kind of blurry. But I could feel his weight on top of me and I kept feeling the breathing on me. And then the thing or the man started trying to like suck on my ear and I could feel the sensation, but at this point... I think I realized I was in sleep paralysis and couldn't wake up. I kept pushing my body to try and wake myself up and finally I was able to. And when I woke up for real, I looked and there was nobody there and my husband was still at the gym. I know it's super creepy but for some reason I wasn't really scared at first. Also my dog was napping next to me completely passed out. And I feel like if it was something bad that he would have sensed it and woken up and barked. 
But the strangest thing was that when I went to touch my ear, it was actually wet. And I have no idea how that could have actually happened. So I grew up in a small town in the Midwest, where my family lived close and everyone, at the very least, knows their neighbors pretty well. On our block, my grandparents lived on the corner closest to us. On the opposite side of my grandparents' house, we had an elderly neighbor with her house facing the smaller cross street. So between the three houses, all of our backyards connected, but part of our backyard was fenced off because we had a pool. So to get from my house to the elderly neighbor's house, we would have to walk out our back door and cross into my grandparents' yard and turn left, walking the outside of the fence through a wooden garden arch into the neighbor's backyard. Now, the elderly neighbor was my best friend when I was little. She was widowed before we ever met and lived alone. She did have adult children, but I never saw them until after she passed. We would garden together all the time, in fact, we did craft projects together. My favorite, though, is when we would sit on her couch together and she would have me read comics from the newspaper to her. It drives my mum nuts, but I give this neighbor a lot of credit for my ability to read and write, well before I ever started school. While I haven't technically started the story yet, I just wanted to set the scene so that you get a glimpse into what this all looked like. This was a very peaceful town. The people around us loved us and knew us well. There was never any disturbing events prior to what follows. I had spent years in and around these three houses and beyond, and never encountered anything negative. And this started as a single event when I was about 12 years old. So, it was an early afternoon in the middle of summer. My mum and I were in our kitchen sitting at the table. She was looking at a magazine and I was reading a book. Our back door was off the kitchen. She was sitting with her back to it and I was facing the window across the table that shared the exterior wall with the back door. It was a really hot day too and we never had AC so we were enjoying the breeze from the window. My older brother, about 14 at this time, had been outside mowing the elderly neighbor's backyard. The back door opened and I looked up to see him coming inside. At first I assumed he was just sweating but quickly realized that he was actually in tears. He wasn't sobbing but was whimpering, like people do if they're exhausted or defeated. He was extremely pale and just stood there inside the doorway. My mum had turned toward him as I was still studying him, trying to process his state of emotion. He was just staring at us both though, looking up the couple of steps to the kitchen, wide-eyed and shaking. My mum obviously asked what's wrong as she quickly got up, moving to him. She immediately wrapped her arms around him and the sobbing started. Then his words came spilling out of him, not incoherent but so rapidly and hysterically that it was pretty startling. I don't remember everything he relayed verbatim, but he started rambling about hearing voices, moving shadows, footsteps around him, and no one visibly there. My mum then lifted this 14-year-old, gave me a glance, and carried him sobbing to the living room. I honestly don't know how their conversation ever ended. I'm pretty sure at this point that she thought that he was suffering from some kind of heat stroke. I was shaken by my brother's distress, but also intrigued by what he had been saying. I was 12, it was summer, it was daylight, nothing was going to scare me. So I walked right out the back door, took the short brick path into my grandparents' yard, turned left, and walked the fence line towards the garden arch. The second that I passed under the arch into the elderly neighbor's yard, I felt instantly nauseous. It was intense, in fact. The best way that I can describe it is the sort of painful nausea that follows a heavy blow to the abdomen, minus the actual impact. I doubled over, holding my stomach. I immediately noticed the air was heavier and increasing in density, and felt very, I don't know, electrified almost. It was a lot like standing inside of television static, like every atom was charged and visible to the point that you could see them move as you moved through them. 
I started to hear footsteps, initially soft thumps on the ground. I could feel them too. This was accompanied by a faint and very cliche sort of maniacal laugh that seemed to be coming from the treetops, like a single voice but from every tree or in the atmosphere itself. Then I kept catching glimpses of shadows that started in my peripheral vision but remained present till I focused on them before disappearing. They didn't have any discernible shape or consistent size, well, yet at least. Still clutching my stomach, I stood up slightly. The footsteps were getting heavier and heavier with every second to the point that if I were to see a group of giants running circles around me, I wouldn't have been surprised. The laughter kept getting louder until it peaked at more of a sort of shrieking, mocking sound. The shadows were the same. The air was the same. The trees, though, they started shaking. Mind you, there was no wind this day. These were giant oaks as well. Some of them almost five feet in diameter, and they were shaking like rattlesnake tails from trunk to the very top. As you can imagine, my head was spinning. My senses were all going crazy. I was well beyond terrified and forced myself to ignore the pain, stand up full, and run. I turned and ran back through the arch parallel with the fence and caught more shadow movement near it. I turned to look and saw what seemed to be four tall figures, like shadows that were cast into nothing, completely black, no transparency. They had no detailed features within the blackness, but the edges of them seemed like the outline of seven to eight feet tall cloaked bipedal figures. I couldn't see any faces, but I could still tell that they were looking at me. They sort of floated along the ground too, which was the oddest thing to me at the time, moving with me, but were about 20 feet away. Then, one after another, they disappeared into nothing, behind nothing. Well, I frantically made my way back to the house, threw the door open, ran inside to see my mum back in the kitchen. I immediately started telling her everything. She gestured for me to calm and quiet down. I lowered my voice and finished sharing my experience. She asked me not to say anything to my brother because he was also very shaken and would be very upset to hear more about it. He was always the most sensitive out of us all as well. But after that, that was about it for that day. Within the next year or two, we had moved to a smaller town and a new house, unrelated to these events, mind you. My brother never had any other experiences. My other two brothers never experienced anything, and neither did my parents. But those years and beyond up until age 17, for me though, were very different. I started experiencing this static atmosphere and moving shadow events on a regular basis, starting less frequent and increasing to almost weekly occurrences at a minimum. These events would happen randomly at any time of the day, I was alone or even sometimes in company. No one else ever seemed to notice it though. They became so common that it mostly stopped being frightening in fact. There was always a, a sense of unease though I guess. Like when you get the sense that someone you just met is probably not a good person. Except in this case, the creepy or bad person is actually ten or more amorphous shadows that move in and out of existence at random. And their presence means that you can feel every molecule around you. Then it even got to the point where I could make them appear. I know it probably sounds stupid. Like why the heck would I even want to do that? Honestly, I didn't want to, but my curiosity compelled me to try it one day. I can no longer do it anymore, nor have any interest, but in an attempt to describe the process, basically I would focus my mind's eye into a mental tunnel vision type state, like I was forcing my brain to stare through an opening in my forehead. This would switch on the atmosphere effect, and the shadows would soon follow. Once that became easy, the event stopped being spontaneous. On occasion, I would see if I could still do it. That would satisfy my curiosity and I'd leave it alone for a while. Honestly too, as I share this, I realize I have no idea of how these events concluded every time. I assume that it was constrained to my surroundings in the moment and just walking away was sufficient. 
But then one night, whatever these things were, they forced their way back in and it was also the night that it all ended. At the new house, we had a lot of property and outbuildings, but one of those became a sort of playroom for my brothers, myself and whoever we were hanging out with. We could be as loud as we wanted out there and be loud as late as we wanted to because it was far enough from the house that we wouldn't disturb anyone. I had picked up playing a guitar a few years prior and would spend a lot of time down in that building since I could be as loud as I wanted. I had just gotten a new amplifier so I was excited to use it as much as I could. It was late evening, early morning and I had been playing for hours at this point. I noticed that the volume knob on my amp seemed loose and kept sort of slowly turning lower gradually. This annoyed me so I cranked the amp all the way up and started playing as fast as I could, just watching the knob, when suddenly it twisted straight to zero right in front of me. The moment my amp went silent, the air just exploded with the previously mentioned electricity more intense than I had ever experienced. Since I had been leaning forward watching the amp, I wasn't focused on the room around me. And as I sat up, I realized that it was teeming with these creature things, these shadows. I was alone in a room with easily over 50 of them at that point. They seemed to almost ignore me mostly, but not as if unaware. More like I was just old news, I guess. The way these things moved was always gliding though. They would disappear in a way that was like an object rapidly melting but out of existence instead of leaving a puddle. Then they would reappear somewhere else. In any case, I felt frozen in my chair until I saw a larger movement from my left side. I turned and saw one of them on the wall, clearly defined in form as a giant spider. This thing was about the size of a crib mattress. Again, internally formless, but I was able to discern some movements. I know that spider anatomy doesn't work this way, but I also don't believe for one second that this was actually a spider, wherever it was from. This was just a chosen form, I think. So I could tell that the carapace or head was slowly rotating toward me by the way of the edges of it moved. It appeared to eyelessly catch my presence and... It suddenly dropped from the wall to the floor behind a stack of boxes. I didn't know what its intentions were, so I leapt out of the chair and ran out of there as fast as I could. Running up the hill to the house for the first time, I could feel the accompanying unsettling darkness pursuing me. It was closing in physically and also in my head. I got inside and ran to my bedroom, dove face first into my bed, burying my face into a pillow and... I pulled my blanket over me. I could feel darkness invading the space around me, enveloping everything. I had prayed many times before in my life, but never like this. I really didn't know what else to do, so I just started praying as hard as I could. The only thing that I was praying was, please, please make this stop. I don't want this anymore, over and over again. And in a dark house with my face in a pillow, I suddenly just had the sensation of light coming through my eyelids. This itself was startling, so I sat up and looked for a source, but there was nothing. But I remembered and felt darkness again, so I went back to my original position in prayer. Light came again. Again I looked up and again I saw nothing but could feel the dark presence returning. Realizing that it could only be returning if it had been receding... I went straight back to prayer and I didn't stop. The light returned and started to build an intensity. It got to the point that it should have been blinding, but for some reason it wasn't. I was also overwhelmed with a sense of warmth. I hate being warm at the best of times, but this was the most comforted that I've ever felt. As the light reached its brightest point, there was also what sounded like a soft roar that came with it, and then it just went out. Everything was dark again, but there was no foreboding darkness anymore. There was no fear, just calm. I remember sitting in my room after that, just sort of looking around and not knowing what to do. 
Eventually I got up and I think I went to the bathroom and after that it just never came back. So yeah, that's pretty much everything and I've never really told this to pretty much anyone before but it feels good to finally get it off my chest. This is a, a nightmare that has stayed with me for years and it really felt like something supernatural or paranormal was happening to me. Let me first start off though with the way that my apartment was set up. This is important too. So I rented an apartment out of a house. Landlord lived in half of the house. Our apartment was the other half. The living room looks like it used to be one big room but was later divided by a set of French doors to make the bedroom area. So when facing the French doors in bed, I can see through the living room windows and across the rooms. I couldn't breathe though one day. I sprung awake in bed with a cold sweat, erratically breathing, shaking and slight dizziness. It must be my blood sugar. Let me check. 155. No, I'm not low. I started panicking because I don't know what's wrong, only increasing my symptoms. I decided to go into the bathroom and splash my face with some water and use a washcloth to dry up. I hung it on the towel rack and I made my way back to the bedroom. But on the way back, I was stopped in my tracks. Suddenly, I couldn't move. It felt like in a dream when you're trying to walk or run and you feel like your legs are filled with cement. I started going down, desperately trying to drag myself across the floor to reach the foot of my boyfriend to wake him up for help, when all of a sudden I wake up in my bed, fuzzy. What? I guess that was a dream too. I quickly drifted back to sleep. I woke up again shortly after, as I often do in the middle of the night. I roll over to get comfy and I face the living room window. The blinds are mostly closed, but are askew so that you can see out the bottom half of the window. And I see a silhouette standing there. I roll back over to wake up my boyfriend in a panic, but before I can wake him, I woke up again. Another dream. I roll back over to the window again. And now I see a face in the window. The best that I can describe it, it kind of looked a bit like Darth Maul from Star Wars or that demon from Insidious. I rolled over to my boyfriend in a panic again and the same thing happened. Before I can wake him up, I wake up from a dream. Or so I thought. I rolled over to the window side again and now it's in the living room. I wake up in bed again thinking... Whoa, I've had dreams where I thought that I woke up, but never multiple times like this. I roll over, and now it's right outside the set of French doors. I wake up again, and now it's on the bedroom side of the doors. Again, now it's standing next to me. Again, now it's at the foot of my bed just staring at me. Again, still standing and staring. I repeat this process at least 10 or 15 more times, and... Each time an aura of dread filled the air, the feeling of primal fear was just terrible. It never really attacked me, but it did pull on and sharply scratch my legs a few times, it seemed. Every time that I woke up and I see it, it's still there. I start slapping myself, pulling on my hair, scratching myself, screaming at it, and anything that I could think of to try and wake myself up from these nightmares again and again and again. Eventually, I, I wake up after what seems like hours of this. I look around and the room is empty. No Darth Maul demon anywhere to be seen. And it seems like I'm finally awake for real this time. Tears of fear and relief come into my eyes when I realize that this horrible dream is over. I lay back down and I snuggled up to my boyfriend, being the big spoon and decided to wake him up for some much needed comfort. I shake him awake and he slowly rolls over to face me, except it's not him, it's this thing. I go to scream but before I can, I wake up again. The feeling of dread has completely vanished and I slap myself a few times just to make sure that I'm awake this time and it seems that I finally am. It's around four in the morning and I am absolutely exhausted. 
But after that, I'm definitely not falling back asleep again. And the search of the house, that would have to wait until daylight hours. I was way too scared to leave the bed again, but once a few more hours had passed, I decided to get out of bed. I was wondering how much of the night was part of the dream. Did I really wake up in a cold sweat or check my blood sugar or even go to the bathroom to wash up at all? I checked my glucose monitor and there was the result, time stamped around when I remember getting up the first time. Then I checked the bathroom and the wet washcloth is hanging on the towel rack. So apparently I did wake up in a cold sweat, did test my blood sugar, even went in to go to the bathroom. I have no explanation for what happened after this, but this much seems to have happened. If I did go to the bathroom and if I did pass out on the floor, how did I wake up in bed that first time? I know that all this sounds nuts, but I think that maybe my body went back to bed after washing my face, but somehow I or my consciousness stayed behind in the bathroom or something. My body was asleep, but my soul was perhaps somewhere else. I've never experienced anything like this prior or after, no matter how many times I've tried to replicate it. But there must be a, a logical medical explanation for this, or maybe I had a reaction to something, but I don't know. It was unlike any nightmare that I've had before, and I've had them frequently. This one, though, just felt so different. This isn't the first time that I've experienced something paranormal either. I'm fairly convinced that my childhood home was haunted or some kind of paranormal sensitivity runs on my mother's side of the family. My childhood home is also my mother's childhood home. My grandma lives with us too. We're upstairs and she's downstairs. And her mother, my great-grandmother, lived there as well and slept in my grandmother's current bedroom but passed on before I was born. Also, before I was born, the house was only one level. My great-grandmother who passed, she was blind and mostly deaf toward the end. And it's not uncommon for patients like this to hallucinate, auditorily, visually, or tactically. And she always saw and heard people coming through the walls, windows, heard scratching and banging, felt people touching her. Again, it's probably nothing. But considering the other experiences... I don't know, there might be some validity, even if it is exaggerated. My grandmother frequently feels someone sitting down on the foot of her bed at night. When my mother and father were first dating and he spent the night, once he woke up to see a woman rocking back and forth in a rocking chair knitting. When he described what she looked like to my mum, it sounded a lot like her grandmother. My mum claims to be able to astral project, not on purpose, it just happens apparently. And in these dreams, she can fly around and even into houses, houses that we've never been in, only for her to confirm that it's what the house looked like after visiting or being invited into the neighbor's house. Also, some other first-hand experiences that I've had in this place is that my bed would randomly shake, as if there's a sort of small earthquake going on or if a really big truck rolled past the house or something. But there was never anything there and no earthquakes either. I lived in New York, so earthquakes weren't a regular thing by any means. I felt taps on my shoulder from behind when alone in my kitchen. Once I woke up in the middle of the night to grab some water from the kitchen and realized that my dog was growling. Then this shadow figure ran right through me. But there was also this time that... Almost every picture in the house of a, a late relative all fell off the walls at once. And well, I know that this all sounds like complete BS. All of this probably does, but sometimes I dream of the future and not anything major, like I'm walking down a road I've never been on before. Then within the next few days, I'm in an area that looks exactly the same as my dream. I know that this could be something else like deja vu, but... Sometimes I wake up with injuries that I'd suffer in a dream, like scratches and bruises. But I'm also super clumsy, so that could be an explanation for that at least. Also, for whatever reason, streetlights frequently go out when I walk under them. And I get this feeling and can sort of tell when one will. I'm not sure if it's related to all of this, but it's super creepy, let me tell you. 
Anyway, I just wanted to get this off my chest and thank you for listening, even if you don't believe in all this and you don't believe my words. It's nice to be able to have my paranormal TED talk and just get this all out. My parents and I lived in a little old house in a sleepy neighborhood for about seven years. During that time, my parents fought almost constantly, bad fights too, physical hitting and shoving and dragging even. They acted positively demonic when they were fighting and it was almost every day for hours on end. We noticed other things happened in the house too. My dad would wake up to find various things sort of unplugged when they had been firmly set the night before. We had an unfinished basement and every time that I went down there at night to get the laundry, I literally had to pray to God because the feeling of intense dread and terror was just so strong. I really don't know how to describe that, but it was just terrifying. It was almost like when I had my back to the room while digging into the dryer or whatever, I felt like I was prey for an animal. One time during lunch, my grandpa was over and we all froze because the sound from the basement of a large garbage bag being dragged across the concrete was echoing throughout the whole house. Not falling, not slipping, but dragging. We all got real quiet and for some reason just ignored it and went back to talking. Around the time that my parents got therapy for their issues and were rebuilding their bond with each other and me, I fell into a deep depression at that time. About a year after that, the nightmare started. Horrible, horrible dreams almost every night, nearly always involving some dark evil being who wanted to hurt me. It would whisper to me and say that I should end my own life and I'd always wake up panicking and flip my light on. The feelings of dread started to intensify and I'd find myself up the entire night to avoid my dreams. I remember one particular night, I was alone in the living room, lamps on, watching a Hallmark show and using my headphones, and out of nowhere, I was struck with the feeling that I was in danger. I tore off my headphones and paused my show, and I just sort of sat there on the couch. I didn't hear anything, I didn't see anything, but I have never felt such bone-crushing fear in my life. I thought that I was going to choke and die or vomit from the nausea and tension that I felt. I was completely frozen in fear. And then, suddenly, just like that, it passed. The last big thing was a couple of months before we decided to move to a different house. I had never told my parents what I'd experienced yet, but I woke up at about 2.30 in the morning... I sleep with my dog on my bed, 17 pounds of goofy little guy, super gentle, has never growled at anything, he just plays pretty much. All except this time. I heard one of my parents cross my door to go to the bathroom, as they often did at night, but I never recalled seeing a light come on or the door shut, though I blamed it on my half-sleep state, I guess. But as soon as I saw that shadow pass under my door, and heard the steps, my beautiful docile little dog woke up and leaped on top of me. He growled the most vicious snarl that he has ever made and he was just staring at my door. His heckles were up and he was definitely protecting me from something. I still thought that maybe he'd been surprised even though it scared me, but I woke up the next morning and asked my parents if they'd been up last night. He both said no, and at that, I was really scared. Exactly on moving day, the night before that we were to pack up once and for all, I had the worst dream ever. Invisible things were hitting me and throwing furniture and saying, you can't leave. I woke up crying so hard that I started having an asthma attack. I don't even really have asthma. But the first night in our new home... There were no nightmares. I slept peacefully. We've lived here for a year now, and I've had no fear, no dread, no bad dreams, nothing. And it's amazing. But I want to clarify that my family and I, we're highly religious. We believe it's best not to speak about demons because they like being spoken of. 
I also wish to clarify too that we owned absolutely nothing that would draw them. No demonic media, antiques or anything. And yet, I just know that we left something behind back there. I still feel the tightness in my chest every time that we drive by that place too. It's a terrible place. A really sad, lonely and dark place. Somewhere I will never return. This happened a while ago, but I still remember it vividly, although I'm still not entirely sure what I saw that night. Quite a few years ago, my friends from home were all back from college over Thanksgiving break. We ended up planning a girls' night at one of my friends' houses, and all planned to sleep over since we would be drinking and staying up late anyways. I had a little bit of a cold and my nose was stuffy, but I decided to go anyways. This was before COVID was a thing of course, but throughout the night, my energy started to decline and I started feeling more and more sick. I couldn't breathe it all out of my nose anymore and since it was late, I decided to just take some cold meds and suck it up for the night and drive home early in the next morning. But once we went to bed, I realized quickly that I couldn't breathe well while laying down and it was uncomfortable for me to try and sleep and not disrupt the other girls with my sniffing and loud breathing. At about 3.30 in the morning, I decided that I just couldn't take it anymore, so I quietly got up to leave. I lived two towns away, and it was super dark outside. It was chilly out, but not super cold, where you sort of needed a winter coat or anything like that. About halfway home, I saw what looked like a person in all black creeping around the side of a house. As I got closer, I noticed too that... They were wearing a black ski mask to cover their face. Again, it was chilly but not that cold outside. As I began to drive closer to the house and the person saw my car and I saw them duck behind the trash can on the side of the driveway. I drove by and realized pretty quickly that what I had just seen was creepy but I felt super sick and delusional and I just wanted to get home so I didn't drive back to look again. I thought about calling the cops, but I didn't even know the addresses of the houses or what was actually going on, to be honest. When I got home, though, I slept on my parents' recliner couch so that I could breathe better and I got some rest. In the morning, I told my mum about what I saw on the drive home and she didn't seem worried at all and told me that it was probably just someone taking out their trash late at night. And I guess she could be right, but I still wonder why he was wearing a ski mask and seemed to hide the second that he noticed me, about to pass the house. Days and weeks later, I was constantly looking up the news in that town to see if there had been any reported break-ins or robberies, but I never did find anything. It still creeps me out though, just thinking about it. And who knows, maybe that night, me being sick and coming back when I did, stopped something really horrible from happening. Around a year ago, I got a message on LinkedIn from a fellow networker. It was a man with a very little information. If any, it's really vague. No profile picture and over 500 plus connections. His name is also very generic and it isn't easily distinguishable. Same with the job that he has. It's very generalized. I was new to LinkedIn though, just started out in the professional world and was open to talking to anyone that was within the realm of my degree. I get a message from him asking if I'm related to Mrs. and gave the last name. He says that he went to a specific high school which checks out where this woman that he named used to be a student librarian and would have seen hundreds to thousands of kids when she was there and employed. I said that it was my dad's ex-wife and I'm not related to her, but she no longer has that last name anymore. He told me that her and I had a lot in common with working at libraries, and I smile reacted to his message. We aren't connections, nor friends on LinkedIn, nor anywhere. He tells me that it's an honor to know me, to which I also emoji react and don't respond. We chatted for a bit after that, with me giving up no new info than what was in my profile, 
for the weeks and months to come, he'll send every time that I'm on, he's on. Any time that I update anything, he's the first to comment and send me a message. It's almost like he's never offline, in fact. The last encounter was two days ago when I updated about my new job at a medical group, and he messaged me saying that he was proud of me and congrats. I said thanks, but then he said... I looked up the name of the place. There's a lot. Which location are you at? To which, I have not and will never respond. I've brought this up to people in my life and they say that this is what LinkedIn is for. But to me, this is creepy and borderline stalkerish with zero way to verify who this man really is. Last year in December, my mum was hospitalized and I was staying at my sister's house, a spare room in the basement. Everything was going pretty okay for the first few nights, but on night three, everything changed. I couldn't sleep well and it didn't help that I kept hearing weird noises too. There's a closet in the spare room and that night, I could hear movement from it where there should have been none. It almost sounded like, I don't know... Someone or something was moving something heavy and dragging it around in there. The closet isn't very big, mind you, so that's what made it even weirder. But I just thought that it was my mind playing tricks on me, even though I'm a believer. And I've had so many encounters with the paranormal now. I just didn't want to believe it, I guess. I was already going through a lot and was scared that my mum was going to die. I didn't want another thing, you know, to have to worry about. Anyway, sometimes the dragging noise in the closet would stop for a little bit and then continued. Other times, there would be a scraping sound outside the tiny basement window. It didn't sound like an animal, it sounded almost metal I guess, like a, a shovel or something was scraping at the window. It was weird, but whatever. I had fallen asleep at some point, but I woke up in an almost completely dark room, even though there was a nightlight on. That puzzled me for a moment, but I was really scared, but my fear intensified when I saw a, a very tall man standing in the corner by the window. The man was so tall that his head was almost touching the ceiling, in fact. He had torn up clothes on, like as if he'd been through some hard times, maybe. It looked like he had dark, long hair and a long beard that matched his hair color. He had his arms crossed against his chest, and... Then, the most terrifying thing happened. He turned his head and looked at me. We made eye contact for several long seconds that felt like an eternity before he literally just vanished and the room suddenly became way less dark. I looked at my phone to see that it was four in the morning. I didn't go back to sleep. I didn't see the man again, but I could almost feel like... Someone was watching me. Later on, I told my sister what happened and she was freaked out. She told me not to tell her husband or daughter though because they'd be too scared to go downstairs again, which is understandable really. I've been down in the basement several times now since then, but I've never seen the man again, nor have I. I don't know who or what he was, but I hope that I never have to see him again. That much, I'm certain of. When I was in fourth or fifth grade, my best friend was given a Ouija board for her birthday. We loved that thing too. For months, we would sit there with it after school, talking with what we thought were our deceased relatives. I now know that that was a lie. You can only really communicate with the demonic through this medium, or at least that's what I believe. Eventually, a spirit wouldn't leave her board though. His name was Steve, which is kind of ironic because that is also our creepy neighbor's name. Anyways, Steve wouldn't leave the board, even though we'd asked to speak with our grandparents and other relatives. Our relationship with Steve became more and more violent the longer that we communicated with him, he would threaten our pets and even our own lives in the end. 
we kind of thought it was exciting until one day he took it too far. This day, we brought a third friend to play with us. We were sitting in a circle like normal with our ankles crossed near the board. After playing for a bit and realizing that it was Steve, we decided to say goodbye. Only this time, we didn't finish the goodbye because when we looked down, all three of us had scratches on our ankles. We snatched our hands away and stood up very quickly, thus ending the conversation without saying goodbye. Big mistake. We decided then that we needed to get rid of that board, so we brought it on a little walk with us to the neighborhood pond. I held the triangle piece, my best friend held the board, and the third friend had the box. We threw each of them in different locations in the same pond, and we walked away feeling like a million bucks, chanting, screw Steve and everything else. It was only later that night that we realized that we had royally messed up. At 3 a.m. exactly, I woke up. The energy in my room, all I can say is that it felt really off. It was darker than usual. The shadows were blacker than usual. But then, I noticed that those shadows, they started moving. It was like an entire demonic portal opened up in my room and the energy just went haywire. The first night was definitely the worst too. I felt really alone, I was really scared, I buried my face under my covers and somehow I fell back asleep. The next day I told my friends about it and they couldn't believe it. The exact same thing happened to them at the exact same time. We realized pretty quickly what that meant. We were now haunted by whatever this thing was and we were for the next three months or so to wake up at that same site pretty much every single night. We even had a group chat going and would pretty much only communicate on it at 3 a.m. It was terrifying to say the least and we really thought that it was never going to end. The third friend grew to resent us for a little while because she had only played with us that only horrible day and honestly, I felt sorry for her. Anyways, this story does have a bit of a happy ending, sort of. The haunting came to an end one day after a very heavy rainstorm. Somehow, and I have no idea how, that board washed back up in my friend's backyard. But the weirdest thing is that it was completely put back together in the box with hardly any water damage. That makes absolutely no sense, I know. But my friend kept it under the stairs in the basement for many years. We never hung out in the basement alone ever again after that. Eventually, she did something kind of uh, mean, I guess, but she left it at a friend's house after a sleepover. Pretty sure the girl doesn't even know that she has it, but after that, her basement didn't seem creepy anymore and we never woke up at 3am to the site ever again, which obviously we were really relieved about. But after this whole experience... I promised myself that I would never mess with those things again. I cannot believe that they sell them in the children's aisle of all things. So, to begin, I'd just like to tell you that I've always been a believer of the possibility that certain paranormal phenomena could be real. And... I do believe that I also experienced one 12 years ago. I was 21 years old and working at a hotel for the summer. I'm from Greece. I met there a woman, then 32 years old, that was different. She wasn't beautiful or anything, but I felt sort of magnetized by her. Not in a sexual way, but just sort of in a, a different way. Almost like charisma, I guess. We started hanging out and she told me, after I told her that I believe in the paranormal, that she has done some things in this field. I was really interested in these kinds of things at that point, so we were almost always together when we didn't work. She clearly wanted me, but I didn't want her. But anyway, one night we were four people in my room and we were drinking wine. But all of a sudden she started staring at me in a really weird way and... 
I just couldn't take my eyes off of her. I felt sort of completely paralyzed and afraid and my heart was beating really quickly too. The next thing that I know is that her face began sort of melting. I really can't describe it better than that. And literally taking other forms which seemed ugly and sort of demonic to me. I was scared to death by that moment and completely immobilized. And after an enormous effort of will, with me sweating, I took my look from her, while the others didn't seem to realize that anything was going on. When the others left, I asked her what she was doing to me, because I was 100% sure that she had done something and that whatever it was, it was evil. She said to me that she tried to open my chakras or something like this, and after a while she left. I didn't sleep at all that night and after some hours I went to work but the strange thing was that despite my sleeplessness I didn't feel tired at all. On the contrary I was full of energy and felt extremely positive. When I noticed this too I saw everywhere in the sky something like I don't know silver shining spots. All of this eventually went away but after about a month I left from that job and we never saw each other again. I know it's a weird story and I have no explanation for any of it, but that's why I'm here. I'm wondering if any of you guys have any idea of what this might be. I had this experience about a year ago. I had first gotten my LED lights and at night I kept them on red to help me sleep out of nowhere, my room started to get colder than usual. It's pretty cold all year round here. It's in the basement too, so that doesn't help. And sometimes I felt drafts, but I kept my door closed all the time. And then I felt like something was in my room with me, watching me, but nothing ever seemed to be there. Soon I also started seeing what I thought was a tall shadow man in the corner of my room every other night or so. That was the beginning. After a week or so, I saw this huge lady on my ceiling. She was skin and bone and had long dark tangled hair and her skin was pale as it could get. Her face was very thin and her eyes were really deep sunken holes and she had no lips. She also had long thin and sharp fingers. She would be holding onto my ceiling just above me and when she arrived I, I never could move. I remember being awake while I saw her and the man in the corner as well, but they both went away after I blinked and looked away for a few seconds. It was weird. I also had a deep fear that something would grab me by my head or neck from behind my headboard, which had wide gaps between each board. But one night, I remember specifically that night I was laying in bed, just turned my phone off to go to sleep and I saw the shadow man, the lady on my ceiling the feeling of something behind me. I looked at the shadow man in the corner, then looked up at the lady. I blinked, looked away a few times, but this time they didn't leave or go away. I felt a coldness wash over me like I had sometimes whenever I saw them and I stared up at the lady, genuinely terrified at this point since they weren't leaving. At some point, the lady on my ceiling started moving she has never moved during the times that I've seen her, but this time she moved. She turned her head to the side while staring down at me like always, and slowly started reaching down towards me. I had this strong temptation to reach back up and touch her hand, but I didn't. I figured that something bad would happen if I did. After a few seconds, I closed my eyes tightly, and after I opened them, they were gone. But my room was now so cold that I could see my breath. I haven't really seen anything like the two things in my room since then, but my room does get insanely cold sometimes and I often feel like something's with me. The last time that I genuinely felt like the shadow man was with me again was in November when I was very sick. I was in a cold sweat in my room and I must have passed out at some point without turning on my LED lights. I woke up at around 3 or 4 in the morning, being colder than usual, and I saw a dark mass right in front of my face. 
That was the last time that I saw anything, and I still feel like things are watching me, or that they're near me in my room, but it's always in my room, nowhere else in the house, which is really strange. I'm really confused by all of this, and I would really like someone to talk to about it with me, and I don't know what it is, I don't know if it's sleep paralysis or something else, but whatever it is, I just want it to stop. This took place last year, at the beginning of summer. I was with my mum, headed down to my nana's farm to visit for a weekend. For some context too, she lives on a farm way back in the country, right at the foot of a mountain in rural SC. It's a, a very rural, secluded area, so the roads are badly maintained and barely wide enough for two cars to pass one another. The houses are also spread out and set far back into the tree line from the road, so there's very little ambient light besides the headlights of a car. In any case, my mum and I are driving along, her in the driver's seat and me in the passenger. It was around 11pm and we're about 15 minutes out from Nana's, deep in the woods with the radio down almost to silent. We come onto this straight stretch out of the road into a heavily wooded area, and suddenly... This blur of a creature darts out across the road, right at the edge of our headlights. It was moving pretty fast, but both me and my mum were able to get a good look at it, and both agree on what we saw. It was a fairly large creature, roughly the size of a person or bigger. Neither of us could make out the head, but we both remember it appearing to have a sort of segmented body, my mum's words, as if it were emaciated and its ribcage was poking out. The reflection of light made it hard for me to tell the color, but my mum said that she remembered it to be dark and she didn't see any fur or hair. It had long limbs and as it moved across the road, it didn't run the way that a, a dog or a horse would with all four legs. The best way to describe it would be loping, using its front limbs to pull itself along and was moving considerably fast. We both said something along the lines of, what the heck was that, as it crossed in front of us. As we got up to where it had crossed, I turned to look at it, just as it reached the other side of the road, and out of our headlights, and I swear on my life that it stood up and ran. Not like a dog rearing on its hind legs, it was definitely bipedal. I immediately yelled that it stood up, and we both started getting nervous. I honestly would have thought that I was going insane had I not had another person in the car with me who saw it too. My mum has always been a pretty level-headed person and not superstitious at all, but she, she was very nervous and made me agree not to tell my nana about it, avoiding scarring her which made me recognize how serious this was. I should also mention that there had apparently been a series of attacks on livestock and horses in the area around this time that this happened. People were saying that they found wire fences ripped through and their animals attacked. I don't think any died, but I remember correctly that there were a few horses that were severely wounded. There have been a few other strange instances in the area too, but that was my personal experience. So I've been in my flat for two years now. When this happened, the people living there were myself, 20-year-old female, my flatmate Anna, 21-year-old female, and my other flatmate Joseph, 20-year-old male. Initially, weird stuff happened, like the front door would open when it was locked, or the heating would turn off and on, or the light in the bathroom would turn off and on as well. But one night, it actually scared the living daylights out of me. So, I was asleep, then woke up to what I can only describe as a slender man looking figure over me, pressing down on me, and yelling at me to unlock my phone. Weird, I know. At first, I couldn't move or scream or anything, so I thought, well, that was a scary dream, and then stayed up the rest of the night just reading, because no way was I about to go back to sleep after that. This happened at around 3 in the morning and I text my flatmate Anna, 
Oh my goodness, the weirdest dream I have to tell you in the morning. The next morning, Anna comes to my room and was like, you won't believe this, but last night, I came out of my room at around 3.30ish and saw this slender man thing holding your doorknob and looking like it was waiting to get into your room. At that, I gasped as I had not told her what had happened last night yet with that figure, but apparently it was the same guy. Obviously, we're questioning life at this point, so I wake up Joseph and I ask him if anything weird has ever happened to him in the flat, and he casually goes, oh yeah, sometimes I see like a large figure crouching on top of my wardrobe. So yeah, my flat, it definitely seems to be haunted by this slender man guy. We have continued living here for another year now. Joseph moved out and another girl, Ava, 20 year old female, moved in. Sometimes the lights still flicker and the doors open, but otherwise, no slender man so far this year. So I live in an apartment in Pennsylvania. The building is over a hundred years old, and it's right next to a funeral home. I've been I've been here and never had any real strange experiences, that is, up until the last couple of weeks. I should also note that I have a child that lives with me half the time, and the other half she's with her mum. Now one night, while I was drifting off to sleep, I started feeling the onset of sleep paralysis. All my limbs were going stiff and starting to feel pinned down. Luckily, I was able to snap myself out of it by reaching for the closest thing to ground myself, which was my phone. I was able to sleep fine after that, but then, maybe a week later, my daughter is asleep in her room, which connects to my bedroom through a doorway that sits directly across from my bed. I woke up and I saw the silhouette of a child standing against the wall next to the doorframe for my daughter's room. It was just this black mass darker than the room with no face or distinguishable limbs or hair or anything and it just seemed to stand there like it was staring at me. Her door was still closed and the figure was on the side that would be covered by the door if it were open. I was definitely freaked out by this but I chose to try and ignore it, turned my gaze away from it and went back to sleep. When I woke up again a couple of hours later, it was gone like nothing had ever happened. But fast forward a few days and my girlfriend and I are at the flea market and run into a medium selling her wares and talking to people. I told her what I was experiencing and she looked sort of concerned and told me to cleanse my apartment by burning sage. She also gave me a small vial of holy oil to put on my front entrance to keep bad spirits away. She also wanted me to put some on my daughter's forehead to protect her. The next day, my girlfriend and I go to my apartment and we do the cleanse. And while I was cleansing a room, my girlfriend was waiting in the kitchen, which is by the front door. My girlfriend and I suddenly both hear that door slam itself shut. And crazily enough, she actually saw it happen too. But after that, my apartment has felt way more peaceful. And I even no longer get those bad vibes anymore. I do plan on moving out ASAP for different reasons, but this whole situation has me questioning everything. Years ago, my friend and I, being Ouija non-believers, decided to give it a try one day. We just wanted to put it to the test. I mean, why not, right? So one evening, we got together and I lit a bunch of candles to light up the room by candlelight only. Even though I was skeptical about it, I started inviting anyone who wanted to communicate over and show a sign, move the planchette, whatever. I asked questions about showing a sign, is anyone here, etc. About 20 minutes in on inviting the planchette with both of our hands on it remained motionless. But at one point, I was looking across the coffee table in which the Ouija board was on at my friend, thinking that this is just getting boring, when I noted that one of the candles went out as the room got slightly darker. At the same time, 
I saw my friend's eyes move off to the left of me, and I thought that must be the candle just behind me, which obviously went out. Anyways, another 20 minutes or so and nothing. We decided to call it quits and went through the process of closing the portal as per directions. Afterwards, we were talking and considering maybe trying it again as nothing happened or so we thought. I went to turn on the living room lamp and started blowing out the candles. Noticing the candle that I thought went out was actually still lit. Huh. Whatever. But this is where it gets weird. My friend then says, don't forget the candle behind the chair. The chair sat in the corner next to the end table where the candle I thought went out was still lit. And I said, what? I didn't put a candle behind the chair, did you? He said no, but what he saw was a light behind the chair go out and thought that I had placed a candle behind the chair in a corner. We pulled out the chair looking for a candle, but there was none. There was nothing there, in fact. So then, what caused the light and when it disappeared, made a distinct difference in the room going dimmer? This was enough for us to stop playing around at this point, as it spooked us, since we really couldn't explain what caused the light behind the chair to go out like that. Enough for both of us to notice, even though I was actually facing away from it. Someone or something showed a sign during the time that this portal was open. We never needed nor wanted to communicate again on that board. I think that I actually ended up giving it away not too long after or tossed it in the bin or something, but after that, never again. In my teen years, think late middle school or high school, but my family had a seasonal site at a campground. I spent most of my weekends during the summer and a couple of long holidays there as well. We had a small group of friends, mostly consisting of other kids of other seasonal campers and befriending random one-off campers was not uncommon there. But one particular weekend towards the end of the season, I met Mike. We quickly hit it off and became really good friends playing and trading Pokemon on our Game Boys, hanging out at fires, playing some basketball, usual camp stuff. Mike's dad had invited a few family friends for the weekend, including Andrew. Andrew was a couple of years older than me. He could drive and had a big van that he attached a tent to through the trunk to have what we thought at the time was a pretty sweet setup. For the long weekend, we all hung out too, and we had an awesome time. Come Sunday, Mike, his dad, and most of their party left. But Andrew didn't. We hung out a little bit. He would brag about dirt bikes and ATVs and TVs and other stuff that he had an abundance of, and kept implying that we should hang out sometime outside of camp. I said, yeah, maybe, or something along those lines, knowing that typically camp friends were never more than camp friends. He eventually went home that Tuesday though and I didn't hear from him after that. He gave me his number. I told him that I didn't know mine off the top of my head but I'd call him. Important for the rest of the story but Andrew never knew more than my first name. My mum actually remarried and I didn't have the same last name as her or my stepdad. But fast forward about a year, I'm using AOL Instant Messenger and get a message from someone with the exact same name as me, with a number at it. After a few reluctant messages, they reveal that it's Andrew. It was a bit off-putting, so I just blocked him. A second random message, him again, same name but increase the number on the screen name. We go through this for about a week, and at this point, I had blocked about eight of his fake accounts. It gets so bad that I create a new profile with a different email and am sure to not include any personal information, though I'm still pretty sure the original account had none included anyway. But about eight or nine months ago, no word from him. My family is eating dinner and there's a knock at the front door. My mum calls my name and says that apparently I have a, a friend visiting. And when I get there, it's Andrew. 
we politely ask him to leave and after about 15 or so minutes, he gives in and goes. Then the calls start, first from a number registered to him, which was screened with caller ID, then restricted numbers, again ignored, then from random numbers with local area codes. But when he does get through screenings, usually from younger siblings, he acts like we are best friends, asking me to hang out, offers me free stuff, and I told him to stop calling, but he didn't. My mum tells him that I've moved in with my dad, but the calls kept coming anyway. Eventually, my mum tells him that she's going to call the police and things die down a bit. One more year passes and I'm back at the campground. I'm walking a lady friend that I had met that weekend back to her campsite. And this van pulls up alongside of us and I hear someone call my name. I look over to see Andrew leaning out of his van again. We booked it and ran into the small patch of woods and got back to my family site and I tell my mum what's going on and she flips her lid. She ends up pounding on the campground owner's door, waking them up as it's about 11pm at this point. The police get involved and he's told to never contact me or show up at my house again. A family staying at the campground came over to talk to my parents the next morning and apparently they knew Andrew's parents and told them stories about episodes that he would have and he would need multiple people to hold him down until he would calm down because he would lose control and start acting sporadically and even violently. I saw him once after that too, about three years later, driving that very same van slowly out of an apartment complex that I had moved into. Nothing really ever came of it but I know that he saw me and the fact that I never saw him again makes me feel uneasy about what he was doing there that day to begin with. I have lived in this same house for a decade now. The old lady who used to live here died and her best friend still lives next door and I'm really not sure how long she has left. But this house... It's always been sort of spooky, I guess. It's always cold, it's really old, and I've had weird experiences for years as well. It's very common for me to hear footsteps, doors opening and closing, my cat staring in random corners, my front door once opened and slammed closed by itself, and my mother saw an apparition of a Victorian lady in the front hallway in the middle of the night. I was also once home alone showering downstairs and heard someone aggressively pacing back and forth in my room and opening or slamming closed my drawers as well. However, after a while I guess you just get used to it and you accept the flow of things. For a while the activity died down in fact and things seemed less scary. Plus I moved away for university so I got a huge break from the spooky stuff. But now that I'm back... The activity seems to have spiked a bit. You see, a few nights ago, I was having a particularly hard mental health day, up at about 4am and facing the wall trying to sleep with my back to the door. My radio is always on at low volume and the music was playing, but I suddenly hear the voice of a woman behind me, almost groaning. It sounded like she was letting out all the air out of her lungs, almost wheezing. Obviously, I freaked out at that, and when I looked, there was no one. Yesterday, I was FaceTiming my boyfriend, and I hear footsteps in my house again, which I haven't heard in months. Distinct paces up the stairs, shuffling on the floorboards. I was genuinely scared, and even thought that it was an intruder, but no, there was no one. I am scared that perhaps I'm manifesting some serious mental health issues... I've never heard a woman before in this house and the wheezing was so clear that it was frightening. I don't want to sound dramatic, but I'm so scared of losing my sanity and I don't know, perhaps I am, but my house has always been spooky and this sudden spike has no explanation. I'm going to try and smudge the house with some herbs that I gathered to feel a little safer, so do wish me luck. So 
So this may be a bit long as it'll take me a, a little bit of time to paint the full picture for you guys. I live in an area of the northwestern United States that is heavily forested and mountainous, with a large river valley that was carved out of the earth by the movement of glaciers probably a millennia ago, and thus there are many leftover deposits of glacial sediment forming high plateaus separated by deep ravines, most of which hold small heavily forested swamps in between them. Most of these ravines and canyons are too steep and the soil much too loose to make traveling over them feasible, even for the local wildlife. And so many of them act as their own sort of little ecosystem, each one cut off from the next by walls of glacial silt. I think it's noteworthy enough to mention that this whole valley is sacred to the surrounding indigenous people, known as the Eye of the Dove, and was used as a massive burial ground at one point. Now, Roughly one year ago, I decided to go and take myself out for a day of harvesting some of the spring wild edibles that grow in these swampy oases, wild onions, wild garlic and the like. I decided to go to an area I would yet to explore. Although I was quite familiar with the surrounding area, the specific ravine was new to me. I packed my bag, inspected my rifle and set out walking eager to see what mother nature would provide me with that day. Upon arriving at the entrance to the ravine, I paused to take in my surroundings, listened to the migratory birds singing in their songs, and noted that the wildlife was busy as ever, going about their day-to-day -day lives amongst the timber. I set out through the undergrowth, eyes to the ground, searching for anything of interest. After walking about a quarter of a mile into the ravine, I took a short break to sip some water and pick some pine buds for tea, and it was at this point that... I became aware of the most overpowering silence I've ever heard. Any adept woodsman would tell you that silence is the loudest sound in the timber, and for good reason, as most creatures try to avoid being lunch for something higher on the food chain. I readied my rifle, scanned the short distance I could see through the undergrowth, and noticed just ahead of me the skull of a small goat perched about maybe eye level in the branches of a small fir tree. This immediately struck me as rather odd since there were no farms, houses or homesteads even for like several miles in any direction. Curious but somewhat unnerved at this point I decided to press on and chalked it up to someone trying to keep people away from a good foraging area although that really didn't explain the silence. But I took maybe 20 or 30 steps further and noticed the skeleton of a deer piled up under a cedar tree. I made my way over to it, inspected it as I collected bones as well, noticed that it was still quite ripe and decided to move on. As I was looking up from the first bone pile, I noticed another one, this time a cow elk, not 15 feet away. I repeated the same process again and... As I looked up from the second pile, I noticed a third, a coyote, strewn across a 10 meter area, only identifiable by the skull. Rather nervous at this point, with the hair on my neck standing up and the electric feeling of adrenaline in my gut, I scanned ahead and, to my dismay, I could see multiple skeletons of various animals, all in various states of decay, perhaps six in my immediate field of view. Most were deer, with the occasional elk, coyote, and what I figured to be either a, a young mountain lion or a lynx, perhaps. By this point, I had my rifle shouldered, all my body systems on high alert. I moved forward as stealthily as I could, and began to count the corpses in my immediate field of view as I passed them, and noted the smell of decay mixed with the pungent scent of the swamp that was heavy in the air now. It seemed like there were new piles of bone, skin, or fur every 20 feet for the approximate 300 meters further I moved through the swamp. Mind you, everything was still dead silent, and due to the dense old growth cedar, very dark at this point too. Coming close to the end of the marshy area of the ravine now, I entered a small opening in the timber with just enough of an opening in the canopy to provide a much needed bastion of light. No less than a second after I stopped, I, I heard what I can only describe as a Louisville slugger swinging harder than any man could swing, make impact with a tree, somewhere out of sight ahead of me. 
This happened three times in quick succession each time, and it was an ear-splitting crack. It caught me off guard too. I've spent most of my life roaming the woods, and I've never heard anything like it. I felt the adrenaline rush over my body, the extreme sense of heightened awareness that comes with fight or flight. Every heckle on my body was up now, and the only noise discernible in the immense silence that followed was my own heartbeat. I said out loud the only thing that came to my mind at the time, which was message received, and promptly about faced and made my way out as quickly as I could. Without losing any situational awareness, I had left in the near panic that I felt. I've since been back to this place with a party this time as I refused to go out there alone and after leaving it was agreed that the whole area had a, a feeling like it didn't want us to leave. Maybe it was just nerves, perhaps the placebo effect but recollecting this whole event has given me goosebumps and I don't think I'm going to be sleeping well tonight. I'd be very interested to hear what you all have to say about it, because, to be honest, I'm a bit lost. So I was hunting for black bear one day back in the early 2000s. The area that I was hunting in was northern Clinton County. My ex-brother-in-law and I enjoyed the area and spent many a season scouting and hunting these lands. This part of the county is filled with long hollows, steep inclines, and hard to access trails. We both like to do our own thing and hunt separate terrains, and I would often dive down into the hollows while he scoured the ridge lines, hoping to get a shot at whatever I pushed over the tops. We both carried pretty bumped up two-way radios to give a general idea of where we were, although often the terrain made it too difficult for good reception. This day was a typical PA bear season day. It was on the Wednesday of the season, third and last day of the brief season that it was back then. The woods were quiet with no distant whooping and yodeling of various opening day camps pushing drives through the woods. The weather was cold, grey and windy when we separated to begin our hunt and continued on throughout the day as well. I spent the day still, hunting down this long hollow south of a, a little town in north central Clinton County, with the idea of meeting my brother-in-law at the top of the ridge at the agreed time of 4pm, giving us plenty of time to hike together the few miles back to his truck. After hunting all day, I found an old game trail that appeared to sort of meander its way back up to the ridge line towards where I knew he would have been waiting for me. After close to an hour, maybe around 3.30 I would guess, I made my way two-thirds of the way up to the top, stopping often, scouring the slope for that jet-black fur of a roaming bear. Along the trail, I came upon a, a long-ago used fire ring. It was very rudimentary in its build and appeared to be used only once, I would guess. The ring's rocks were covered in something and only had the faintest of traces of black from a long-ago fire. I found it odd that a fire ring would be here, considering the steepness of the slope but it was a very small, somewhat level ledge. There I figured that I would sit and eat the rest of my packed food and sit still, hoping to catch a final chance to see a bear. All the while though, I don't know, it just felt odd. Somewhat unwelcoming, like I shouldn't be there or something. I almost felt like I was a, a forbidden interloper on someone's valued spot or something. I sat for maybe 20 minutes and thought that it was time to continue the trek upward to my bud. As I stood, I slung my backpack on and reached down to sling my rifle over my left shoulder. But as I stood up, I heard my name called loudly. It didn't really sound like it was behind me, rather sort of all around in my head, if that makes sense. Just as I was going to turn around, my rifle was all of a sudden slapped off of my shoulder. I felt the force. I heard the sound of something slap against the wood of the stock and crouched quickly to save my gun from dashing into the rocks at my feet. I grabbed it in the nick of time and quickly turned around with a, a mouthful of mother for who I thought was going to be my brother-in-law joking with me. But when I did, there was nobody at all there. Absolutely no way anyone could have rushed off without me either seeing or hearing them too. 
I felt a, a sick feeling in my churning stomach all of a sudden, chills throughout my body, muttered a, a few Hail Marys and sped up to the top of the ridge. I met my bud and quietly we hiked our way out of the woods to his truck in the spreading dark of the evening. This has bothered me for years and I haven't been back to those particular woods since that day. Someday I hope to, but I think I'm going to have to muster up the courage to get out there again. So, I'm a truck driver and how my job works is I'll drive to a halfway point and meet with another driver and we'll switch loads and turn back to go home. And well, our meeting point is this parking lot in this ghost town. At least I'm assuming that that's the case given everything surrounding it is abandoned and no other points of interest nearby for like several miles. I've been doing the same thing every night Monday through Friday and sometimes we arrive at the same time, sometimes he waits for me and sometimes I wait for him. Well, last night I arrived before him and I got out to stretch my legs and have a smoke. This is around like 11.40pm. While I was standing there I noticed someone walking up the street. My lights are off and the parking lot is dark so there's no way to see me but Thanks to the lights from the highway, I can see him. I don't want to be seen by him, so I toss my cigarette on the ground and I get into my truck slowly, making as little noise as possible. I climb into the back of my sleeper and close the curtains, but look out the window and all of a sudden I see an entire group of people, all wearing the same t-shirt, walking slowly in a line but stopping for a second every third step. There were possibly 20 or so people in the line, I would guess. I call the other driver to warn him and look through a hole in my curtain as they walk by and then out the other window and see them just sort of casually walking down the road. Yeah, like they were walking down the middle of the road. Like I said, they were all dressed the same too. It was the weirdest thing that I've ever seen. I didn't get out once until the other driver showed up and we swapped and left and this was in Louisiana about 30 miles from Hammond and it's still the strangest thing that has ever happened to me on the job. So I work in a large bunker complex from World War II and I stayed for a night shift the other day. I'm an editor so I had headphones on most of the time. Every now and then, though, I could have swore that I heard some music from somewhere, but brushed it off as just me being tired. At around 1am, I went for a smoke in an area that basically only me and my bosses can access. It's an old stairwell used to transport heavy cargo that doesn't fit in any elevator. As I approached the door, I once again heard music, but this time it was clear as day. As I opened the door, it got really, really loud too. Like as if someone was sitting with a violin at the bottom of the stairwell or something. I work in the fourth floor. No other floor has direct access to the stairwell except the very bottom. Needless to say, I, I was weirded out but thought, well, huh, maybe some composer uses their free time and practices here? Yeah, I know, kind of stupid assumption, but the only explanation that I had in the moment the semi-social person that I am, I went down to see who was playing and say hello, since the music was actually, well, kind of nice. It reminded me a bit of the classical Bioshock music and was, as far as I can tell, played by one single person on one violin. However, after I stepped down like four or five steps, the music just abruptly stopped. Not in the way that you stop a recording too, I could actually hear clattering and sort of sounds from the handling of a string instrument. I went down all the way and looked for any open doors or some way for this person to have gotten in there. But there was nothing and nobody in sight that would suggest someone just played the music there. So kind of disappointed, I went all the way back up. The bunker's floors are about double the normal height so I had to walk up around six floors. But just as I stepped into our hallway the music started again. So I went down again and surely enough there was no one there. At that point too my confusion turned into being 
kind of creeped out a bit. I double checked if every door was locked, which they were, and if the elevator, which had been out for service for a while, worked again. Maybe that's how they got here? But no, it was still stuck below ground floor as it had almost been for a year now. So I thought, okay, every door is locked and the only way in here is to have a key through one of the doors on each floor, five floors in total. So I went back up and waited since I was sure to hear someone unlock a door and step into the stairwell. But no, I reached the top and at eerily that precise moment, I heard weird violin sounds, like someone mildly plucking the strings. Then the music set in again, and it was loud, like really loud this time, sharp and aggressive too. So I went down again, only to find nothing again. At that point, I was actually wondering if I was just too exhausted and started to hallucinate or something. That's how I explained the music to me for the rest of the night anyway. It was only the next morning that my stupid brain realized that I recorded the music the first time that I heard it loudly, so there's no chance of this being just in my head. Can anyone explain what the heck might have been going on? Any theories? Because I'm really confused. So, to preface this story... I was a 21 year old male, 6'2", 240 pounds, not a small or weak looking guy by any means, and I was wanting to lose some weight for a while at this point and had been going on walks for a bit, sometimes during the evening or very late at night even. It was Florida and it gets hot unless it's night time, plus like I said I'm a pretty big dude so I don't really have anything to worry about, or so I thought. One night though, I decided to go out walking around my neighborhood around 3 in the morning in like a big puffy jacket and black pants. I felt like in this situation that I would be the creepy person that someone would be scared of. My walk was going good as usual and was actually getting close to the end of it. But then this old school sort of wood panel passes by and goes into a driveway somewhat in front of me. I barely think anything of it. Always three or six cars go by on one of these late night excursions anyway. But it's what happens next that is what unsettled me. This van pulls back out of the driveway with its lights off. After I pass by the driveway, mind you. Luckily, I wasn't listening to any music or else I probably wouldn't have heard it. The van then proceeds to pull out and drive towards me and stops right in front of me. At this point, I know that I don't want to end up like some kind of horror movie character, so I book it in the opposite direction. I go down an off-branching street and keep going down these random streets to give me as much time as possible. I end up hiding in some random bushes in someone's yard and stay there for a little bit. I wanted to text my mum, but I was scared and didn't want the light from my phone to give me away. So I watch for any sign of them, nothing for five minutes. Just as you think the coast is clear, there they are again. I hear a car coming down the street and it's those same guys but with their lights on this time. I'm pretty hidden in these bushes right against someone's house so they just go by thankfully but my heart is beating so quickly and I'm terrified at this moment. I wait a little bit more until I truly believe the coast is clear and get back to my house as quickly as I can. I wake up my mum and... We called the cops and I give them as much info as possible. They said that they would patrol the neighborhood and after that I, I don't hear anything more. I just can't help thinking about that event though and what their motives were. I always try to debunk stuff like that but all their actions pointed to wanting to do something to me. But what did they want to do? I'm not a pretty young lady by any means. I'm pretty large actually, menacing sort of looking. My neighborhood is not even nice enough to rob. A very just sort of like middle class I would guess. And I mean, what am I going to have on me while walking at like 2am? So I just can't help but think that maybe they didn't want to kidnap me or mug me, but maybe, maybe they wanted to kill me. 
it freaks me out to this day. So I'd like to preface this post by stating that I'm a highly educated and scientific person and have never been a, a believer in the supernatural, Bigfoot, or things of that nature. That being said, I really am at a loss for the things my family has encountered on my property over the last seven years, and would love to hear your suggestions. Seven years ago, my wife and I purchased a property and 11 acres of woods in a rural part of northeastern Minnesota. The woods were connected to a larger acreage of fields and woods of about maybe 160 acres, and although sparsely populated, the land is near a fairly busy state highway. There are some housing developments in the area, but they are like three to four miles away, and the majority of the land all around our property is farm fields, woods, and rivers. It's remote, but with town so close, I wouldn't call it wild by any means. I'm mentioning this too because I've heard many Native American legends of things in the deep northern woods of Minnesota and Canada, but the area in which we live is just not that. Rural, yes, but not the endless north woods. As I said earlier, I'm not a believer in the supernatural and have never been afraid of the woods or the outdoors, even though I have a healthy sense of caution and respect for large bears, moose, wolves, or other potentially dangerous wildlife. I'm also an avid hunter and mountaineer, and have experienced many nights in the wilderness. I've had numerous encounters with dangerous animals or situations, so I'm not spooked easily. And knowing my state of mind is important to my story because many so-called supernatural encounters can be explained by people with an already high level of uh, belief, anxiety, or fear. But that is just not me. Well, that all changed after the first few weeks of moving in, though. The house and the land had been abandoned for a couple of years due to foreclosure, so a lot of work needed to be done to get it back into shape wildlife had grown accustomed to no human presence and black bear frequently roamed the yard at night along with many other woodland creatures. We also found a lot of animal bones scattered throughout the woods and coyotes were abundant. One night in fact during those first few weeks we had a rainstorm and I was worried about a broken downspout potentially causing a basement leak. It was about 10 p.m. so I grabbed my headlamp and headed outside to deal with the situation. Behind our house is a fairly large swampy area that divides the woods. I had my back facing this area while fiddling with the downspout when suddenly I just had this intense feeling of like dread. It's really hard to explain the feeling but it was like my body knew something was back there. It was very unusual based on the circumstances and never having felt this type of fear before too I tried to stay calm and slowly turned around to point my headlamp back towards the swamp. What I saw was something that I still can't explain. Eyes. Numerous glowing reflecting eyes staring back at me. These were not eye reflections that you typically see with a deer or other animal since they were different at heights and when I pointed my headlamp spot beam directly at where you would expect a head to be, there was nothing but weeds and trees. When I turned the headlamp off, they were still there though and glowing, as if a light was being shined. They didn't move, they just stared through me. Needless to say, I bolted and I ran as fast as I could back into the house and explained it away as a deer or raccoons. Later that summer, I was sitting out on a screened-in porch that partially faces the swamp and connected woods to the west. It was approximately 11pm when I began to hear what sounded like a bear fighting with or attacking a cow. Since there was a small farm to the southeast of my property, I assumed that perhaps a cow had wandered into the woods and been attacked by a bear or something. I really didn't know if this was something a bear would actually do, but it was my only guess based on the sounds I was hearing at the time. It was clearly some kind of a roar like a bear, but then followed by a frantic sounding cow's mooing. This went on for over an hour and it was perhaps one of the most horrible sounds I've ever heard. Even though it sounded so strange and I hate to say it but almost supernatural, it didn't frighten me since I had this rational explanation in my head. 
even weirder, this same series of sounds happened again the next summer. These first few years, I never really investigated the area of the woods the sounds came from since it just wasn't my property. But a couple of years later, I had the chance to purchase this area and 70 acres to the west, which consisted of the woods that connected to the mine as well as a few tiled fields, more woods and ponds and stuff like that. As part of purchasing this land, I spent a great deal of time walking around on it to get a good understanding of its value and layout. As part of my walk, I was able to get a much better look at the farm set up to the south. The farm did have cows, as I suspected, but to my surprise, the area that they were kept in was a long distance from my house. In fact, much too far for me to hear them, and the fencing was also extremely well built and electrified. Looking at it now, there was just no way a cow was wandering off from that farm. I didn't really think about this fact until recently, but I feel it's the best way to lay everything out in a chronological order. You see, after acquiring the property, I proceeded to put up tree stands at the various locations along with trail cameras in order to prep for the upcoming deer hunting season. One spot was the hilly woods where I heard those sounds many years prior. Again, I didn't connect these two things until now, but the area was very odd as whenever I hiked through there, I always saw some new strange thing, I guess you could say. One time, my son and I found an old game snare tied to a tree with what looked to be dried blood on the bark. Another time, we found at least a hundred year old tree with a barbed wire fence completely spiraling the entire trunk, growing in it and out of it at different intervals. I've also found many tree trunks with very large scratches or claw marks, not resembling an antler rub. Maybe a bear, I guess? We'd almost always find dead animal bones in this area, and even this winter I found a couple of deer legs snapped and picked clean. My sons have found numerous animal skulls there as well. As I was saying, I put a game camera in this area too, since I'd seen tracks and signs and wanted to get a sense of the best places to hunt. I've placed one there many seasons, and to this day, I've yet to capture a single thing on it. Nothing. My son has posted there a couple of times for hunting season, and has mentioned the strange sense of quiet that he gets there. He's used to the forest sounds coming back after sitting still for long periods of time, but in this spot, there are never any sounds. But what he has mentioned is hearing something walking around through there, though. Another incident occurred one hunting season when I was entering this area en route to another stand when I saw a violent thrashing in the foliage moving fast and crossing from right to left but moving away from my position. I of course encountered deer and bear all the time so I'm familiar with how they move when spooked but this, this was something different. Whatever this thing was made up a high pitched trumpeting combined with bellowing sound that was like nothing I'd ever heard from an animal outside of a, maybe an elk, which we don't have in this area. It wasn't bounding, and there wasn't the raised white tail or large dark mass to indicate a deer or a bear. There really didn't appear to be a body at all, in fact. Just whipping and falling leaves and branches, along with the deafening sounds. A year after this incident, too, my son went out hiking in the woods to try and find me since I was out doing some forest management. As he walked through this area, he thought that he spotted me coming through the woods fast, but quickly noticed the walk and the clothing were nothing like mine. Whoever it was also was a lot taller than me, and he described him as extremely thin. He said the person that he saw did not notice him at all and seemed to be walking in a straight line like they had a tunnel vision or something. Seeing someone in this part of the woods in their direction of travel really didn't make much sense at all too, since really would be no reason to be there or to be headed that way as it leads to deep ravines and an uncrossable river. After he found me though and explained what he saw, I quickly went over to investigate to see if we had a trespasser. I hiked for quite a while but I never found anything or anyone. If someone was there they either got picked up on the road or they completely vanished. That same year, my son had a friend over too and they went for a late afternoon walk in the woods at one point. As it began to get dark, they made their way back by walking on the edge of the field that is next to this area of the woods. As they passed by, they 
said that they saw a figure a little ways off in the trees. But whatever they saw was near one of the hills in this patch of forest and seemed to be making some kind of a hand gesture. It began walking slowly towards them when they called out hey and hello. He or it stopped still and said nothing. It was at this point that the boys said something just wasn't right and they bolted back towards the house. They rushed into the house and told me what they saw and I of course laughed it off as their mind playing tricks on them. My son described the figure as very tall, like 10 to 15 feet, but with skinny arms and his body was dark all over. And not hairy per se, but dark. They even thought that it was an animal at first because of the weird way it looked. He couldn't really describe it very well other than gaunt or skinny and strangely dark. Me being the curious and protective father I am, was worried about it being trespassers, drug addicts or both, so I told them that I would go and take a look. They brought me to the area and pointed to where it was standing and I headed into the woods. Since it was winter and there was snow on the ground, I thought that it would be easy to locate the tracks of whatever this was and find out where it came from or went. But when I got to the spot though, there wasn't a single track or disturbance in the snow. But what I mean is that there was no way that an animal or a man could have been in that area and not left tracks. Which means that they'd either made it up or their minds had played tricks on them. Or so I thought. But to this day my son and his friends still swear that they saw it clear as day and I can definitely attest that their fright was real. My wife also has experienced strange thrashing sounds and other feelings of dread or being watched in those parts of the woods and generally just refuses to go over there anymore. And all of this brings me to today where I had a sudden realization that all of the strange sounds, sightings, bones and events seem to be centered around this area and I'm just at a complete loss to what it all means. It's still too strange to really bring this up and discuss it with people that I know anyway, but I wanted to share my story and see if anyone in this particular community might have any theories or ideas on what we might be dealing with here. I'll continue to investigate on my end, but would love to see what all of you guys think. Anyway, thanks for listening and for any insight that you might be able to share. I started working part-time at a local gas station convenience store over the summer of 2016 to earn some extra money while attending college. When I was hired, I was informed that female employees were never scheduled to work overnight shifts for obvious safety reasons, which I was relieved to hear. I wasn't so much worried about my safety, but I was concerned about getting enough sleep before classes. It wasn't long before I found myself dreading the days that I had to work though, as the job turned out to be much more difficult than I had anticipated. But we were always short-staffed, which forced us to constantly multitask between running cash registers, preparing food, keeping eyes on pumps, cleaning, stocking, etc. But to make matters worse, the two women who managed the place were awful in every way, and I frequently found myself biting my tongue and talking myself out of quitting. I was especially on edge when they cut our 15 minute break down to 10 minutes, as I never seemed to have enough time to use the restroom and smoke a cigarette fast enough. But it wasn't until several annoying encounters with a regular, James, that I finally started to break. James was younger than me, maybe late teens or early 20s, and he thought that he owned the place. Perhaps being the grandson of one of the managers gave him a sense of entitlement to mess with people there. But the first time that I met James, he approached the counter to purchase some chewing tobacco. As I was ringing him up, I asked to see his ID and he told me who he was related to. But I politely asked again to see his ID because I was new. Another employee overheard our conversation and assured me that he was old enough, so I went ahead and rang him up. Staring at me intently the whole time, he looked down at my name tag and said, Mindy, that's a pretty name. I thanked him for the compliment and gave him his dip, but he continued talking to me and asking several personal questions. 
He wanted to know where I lived, what my last name was, whether or not I had a boyfriend, etc. Meanwhile, a long line had formed behind him and, not trying to be rude, I said something like, Sorry, there's a line behind you and I casually mentioned for the next customer to move up. But James didn't leave. He simply stepped to the side and continued talking to me and watching me as I rang each customer up. It was immediately uncomfortable and unsettling for me, but I did my best to pretend like I wasn't bothered. Even when his persistence escalated and another co-worker told him to leave me alone. James soon began to make more appearances after that too. The second time being with his girlfriend and another male friend by his side. Yeah, he had a girlfriend and I was really confused when he started flirting with me again. This time right in front of her. But oddly enough, she didn't say a word. So I brushed it off and played along, assuming that he's just the goof that my co-worker said that he was. But when he sat in a booth with his sidekicks at the back of the store, I could feel his eyes burning a hole right through me. Over time, I grew more suspicious of James, as I would witness him do and say countless things to hurt others. I knew that he was annoying and I had learned to brush that off as an all in good and fun sort of type of humor, like everyone else did. But when I caught him making fun of another co-worker to her face, all I could feel was anger toward him. I removed her from the situation by taking her place at the register as I could tell that she was very hurt and embarrassed by his comments. And by doing so, it was apparent to James that I didn't approve. He would continue to cruelly harass this poor girl and even some of the customers who came in, but trying to make him stop was like scolding a child. I didn't lash out at him though. At this point, I just began to ignore him. James then started playing these head games with me while I was working. He would take soda and candy, walk outside without paying for it, and then come back into the store and say that I forgot to ring it up loud enough for everyone to hear. One night, he even filled up his gas tank and took off without paying for it before returning to say that he forgot to pay. He knew that he'd always get away with it because Granny was the manager. By this point, it wouldn't have surprised me if he really was stealing gas and food from the store though. There was just something very dark and strange lurking behind his goofball facade and I avoided him like the plague, though it was nearly impossible to do at times. But then, one day, while I was working alone with another co-worker, we were very busy with tasks as usual when lo and behold James walked in by himself. I muttered under my breath, pain in the butt, and I walked straight back into the freezer to finish what I was working on earlier. But then, he followed me, inside the freezer. To be honest too, I really didn't know that he was there until he walked up right behind me and asked why I didn't greet him anymore. Startled, I sort of jumped and quickly turned around, grabbing my chest and asking him what the heck he was doing back here. He laughed as I told him I was busy and reminded him that only employees could be in this area. He ignored everything that I said and instead proceeded to ask me personal questions, just like he did the first day that I met him. You never told me where you live, he said. I'm curious about you and I just want to know. Tell me where you live. He was moving closer and closer toward me, literally backing me into the corner of the freezer. Are you afraid of me, Mindy? He asked. I tried to push past him, telling him to move, but he kept stepping in front of me to block my way out. Not until you answer me, he said. I started calling out for my co-worker who showed up and gave him a heck of a talking to for being in the freezer. I was finally able to push past James and I made my way to the front counter where I looked at the clock and saw that it was time for me to go home. I gathered my things and punched out as quickly as I could, but James followed me out of the parking lot. I swiftly got into my car, but James managed to grab the top of the door before I was able to shut it. Come on, just let me see your ID, he persisted. I repeatedly told him no before I found myself practically begging for him to let go of my door so that I could go home. Then he grinned at me and said, don't make me follow you, Mindy. Chills ran down my spine at that point. Knowing how bold of a person he was and considering the fact that he literally just cornered me in the freezer only minutes ago, 
I highly expected him to follow through with that. Threatened by visions of what my drive home might look like, I became angry at this point. I looked at him dead on before shouting, let go of my door and stay away from me. I then grabbed the door handle and ripped the door shut as hard as I could. He tried yanking on the door handle from the outside to open it, but luckily uh, I locked the door just in time. He then continued to knock on my window asking to see my ID, but I started my car and backed away from him. I turned the wheels and hightailed it out of there while he just stood and watched me speed off. I was never so glad to finally get away from him, but I was paranoid the whole way home, thinking that he could possibly catch up to me on the road even though I, I never saw his vehicle behind me. I would end up quitting the job after this, and I didn't care that my hiring manager was angry about it. I had enough of everything, and dealing with James was the last straw. I didn't bother explaining anything to my manager because it was apparent to me that James was probably never held accountable for anything that he ever did wrong in his life, and he likely never would be. I never saw him again after that, and... I hope I never do either. James was a jerk, a clown, a joker, but he was also clearly borderline psychotic. To give some context before we get into what happened, my name is Oliver, I'm currently 22 years old. My brothers are named Ethan, currently 24 years old, and James, currently 20 years old. I now live in Texas, in the US, and this happened to us sometime in the summer of 2011. We grew up in a very rural area of Galicia, Spain. We're British by blood, but Spanish by culture. Growing up, our parents were pretty neglectful. They were alcoholics and their idea of raising us was ensuring that we had a place to sleep and not much else. They also tended to leave us alone for long periods of time while they were out on their booze cruises. So we had grown accustomed to taking care of ourselves. I mean, Ethan practically became a father to me and James and even now I think to go to him first when I have a problem. It all started though one week in the summer of 2011. Our parents left us 20 euros for food and told us that they would see us soon and they left. Like I said earlier, we were used to this and it didn't bother us as much as it should have I suppose. Our parents would shut off the water supply or not pay the bill while they weren't home. Either way we'd end up with no running water. But there was a lake 3 maybe 4 kilometers away from our house and after a couple of days with our parents gone we were starting to smell a bit. We knew a little private area covered by trees where Ethan would make us all bathe and where we'd wash our clothes the best that we could. We got there, stripped down to our birthday suits and washed our clothes before leaving them in the sun to dry. After we hung our clothes on a tree, we got into the water and washed our bodies as much as we were able to without soap. Once we were as clean as we could get, we went back to get our clothes. We walked to our little hidden tree and found that our clothes were all missing. I started freaking out. To get back home, we'd have to walk four kilometers completely naked. And I mean, what if we were seen by someone from school, right? I was just at that awkward stage of school and puberty and life in general, and I didn't want to be known as the boy who had to bathe at the lake because our parents didn't care about us. Ethan, he calmed me down though, said that our clothes must have been taken by someone either watching us or stumbling upon them and pulling a prank. Either way, he told us that we had to pretend that it didn't bother us. If they were watching, he didn't want them to feel like they'd won or whatever. He knew a way home that we could take as well. It was longer, probably double the normal way. It was through the forest though, but it avoided walking past any roads or houses, so we thought that it was the safer choice. And after walking for what felt like an eternity, we had no choice but to take a break. James was tired and my feet were terribly sore, so we needed to rest before finishing our journey home. By this point, it was getting dark out, but in all honesty, we were sort of thankful for the nighttime or the dark. Though, we decided that it was best that we didn't wait too long, 
even though we didn't mind the dark, we thought that it was best that we went stark walking home at night. And just as we were about to start walking once more, we heard something moving. It sounded pretty big. I assumed it was a badger or some other animal, but Ethan was convinced that he saw a man walking ahead of us. He told us to stick close together. He grabbed the nearest rock and sharpest stick that he could find, and we went to investigate. Now, keep in mind, at this point, Ethan was 13, I was 11, and James was 9. None of us had hit our puberty growth spurt, and we were all pretty relatively small kids. All of this, plus, well, we still had no clothes, and apart from nearby sticks and rocks, we had no way of protecting ourselves. James and I stood close together, hugging each other, hoping whatever Ethan had seen was just his imagination. We searched around for maybe five minutes or so when James completely froze and started quietly hyperventilating. We looked at him and he pointed to the distance where we saw three men standing, just staring at us. Now, this is where our memories differ a little. I can distinctly remember what they looked like. Tall, big, muscly men, smiling and staring directly at us. Ethan swears on his soul that they were tall but very thin with faces that were difficult to make out and almost inhuman looking. James remembers a, a sort of combination of Ethan's and mine memories. Tall, muscly, almost faceless, staring directly at us. But whatever the case, we turned and we ran. We had maybe three kilometers left to get back, but we didn't stop until we reached our house this time. We got in, we slammed the door behind us, we went around making sure every window was closed and there was no way that they would be able to follow us in. None of us could sleep that night. We all just huddled together in the living room praying that the time would move faster and daylight would come. Eventually, we all fell asleep though from exhaustion. Now, this is the part that I usually leave out whenever I tell this story to friends. We woke up though to a loud bang coming from the front door. I remember feeling my heart burst from my chest and we slowly and quietly creeped around to see who or what was at our front door. I remember praying and reaching out for God asking for protection at this point, but it wasn't whoever or whatever we saw that night before. It was actually our parents, home and half sober, and for the first time, I felt thankful that they were back, though I wouldn't for long. I immediately knew that they'd been arguing. My mum's makeup was running down her face and you could see the anger in my dad's eyes. He asked us where our clothes were and we tried to explain but obviously he didn't believe us. He was furious that he would have to spend his hard earned money and on new clothes for us ungrateful boys. He walked up to Ethan and told him that if he ever came back again and James and I weren't properly taken care of, that Ethan was going to be kicked out. I don't ever tell anyone that last bit, even though none of us have spoken to our parents since like late 2018. And even though Ethan tells me that it was never our fault, I always feel so guilty looking back on when my dad did that to him. My dad never raised a hand to me or James. He would take his anger out on Ethan and Ethan alone. I hate talking about it, but I just felt like I needed to get it out. Thanks for listening and here's to never going through something like that ever again. Growing up, my school was about 5 kilometers from my home. I had to walk it too because my parents would work until like 7pm every day. But the walk would go through a huge forest. I can probably count the number of times I encountered anyone through this forest on one hand. But this specific time has always stuck in my head and looking back, I think that I may have seen a, a kidnapping or some children trying to escape a kidnapping at least. I was 12. It was late springtime and pretty hot out. I was on my way home and had probably been walking for one, maybe two kilometers when I noticed a group of boys walking my way. The boys had no clothes at all and were carrying what looked to be like a bat, the animal, not the sports equipment. There were three of them. Two were around the same age as me. One looked a little bit younger. 
but they looked flushed and sweaty as if they'd been running or walking for a while. But they were almost dragging the younger boy along as he seemed like he needed to rest. I, though, just sort of froze and looked at them confused. But they were speaking a language that I didn't understand. I can speak both Spanish and English, so it was neither of them. The two older boys had olive skin with dark hair, while the younger one was more pale and blonde. One of the older boys tried to talk to me, but as I said, I couldn't understand whatever language they were speaking. I said to him in both Spanish and English, no, I can't understand. He seemed confused, but he didn't waste any time. He pointed at the big one liter water bottle that I had in my backpack side pocket and shook his fist by his chest as if he was begging me and I gave him the bottle. He made sure the younger boy drank first. They finished off the water that I had left in there and nodded their heads as if to say thank you before carrying on their way that they were going before. I kept on walking home but I felt really creeped out by whatever I had just witnessed. After another kilometer or two, I then saw a man. He was tall and thin and looked to be maybe in his late 20s or early 30s. He was pale, but pale in a way that he looked like ill or sick maybe. Looking back, I think he may have been on something, but that didn't click for me at the time. When I saw him, I tried to keep my head down and keep walking, but he stopped me. In broken Spanish, he said to me that he was looking for his little brothers. They were lost and asked if I had seen them. I shook my head, he said thank you, and carried on walking. I tried my hardest to walk normally, but as soon as he was out of eyesight, I ran and I didn't stop running until I reached my home. Once my parents got home, I told them what had happened. They shrugged it off and told me that I shouldn't worry. When I insisted that I was serious, my dad promised me that he would call the police in the morning and tell them what I had seen. If my dad did call them, I, I was never called in for further questioning. No police asked me for descriptions or anything. But my dad swears that he reported it. Uh, I have my doubts, but I just wish that they would have taken me seriously at the time. It was a cold October night around 11pm when me and my buddy were cruising and stopped to take a smoke break. We got out of a car in a secluded area in a small village called Morsel. The place that we walked to was next to a dark running bike track sort of thing which entered a forest. But we sat down on a bench outside the tree line smoking our well, special cigarettes under the subtle light of the moon. A remarkable thing about this spot was that it is located in view, within 50 meters, of the horror house of Morsel. In 1996, three people were brutally murdered in there and it has since been sealed up. It's well known that the interior is untouched since that time. A documentary was made about this, that's how I know this info. But here's the other thing that I know. The two murderers are already released from jail. And by the time of my incident, one was let go from prison just months before. So, back to the bench. After 10 to 15 minutes, our eyes were able to see better in the dark and I started looking towards the dark path running in the forest. Between the trees, I swore that I saw something which I thought was a bag or a mask on a rope hanging from a branch at maybe eye height. Obviously, I immediately told my friend and he agreed about the conclusion. But after moving a few steps closer and focusing our eyesight, we saw that it was a grown man with like a bag or a mask on his head. In the dark, he was standing in some bushes and we saw the movement of his breathing and that he was wearing regular boomer clothes. First, we quietly told each other, said, what the heck, and confirmed we both saw exactly the same thing. A reminder too that this person was standing like 10 meters away from us and this is for like 10 to 15 minutes in pitch black darkness. Then we were looking at him for another minute until I started yelling at him. Just yelled things like, hey come out. I did this despite being spooked by the strange experience. That's just how I am. He then raised his hand in a motion of aiming a gun and we ran back to the car as fast as we could. Looking behind my shoulder, we saw that he kept his arm located at us, but we couldn't make out if he had an actual gun or if it was just a bluff. 
After getting out of there though and recollecting, we did realize one more very disturbing thing. The guy did not want to mess with two adult young males. In the daylight, a lot of people traverse this place by bike or on foot. So one of the possibilities is that this crazy guy was going to intercept a lone person in the wrong place at the wrong time. This all started when we went to visit my granddad from my mum's side over in Indiana. It's a 10 hour car ride from where we live so we only visit once a year usually for Thanksgiving. We could just take a plane but I have four sisters so on top of me and my parents it's just too expensive to buy tickets for everyone. Anyway, we arrived and everything went about as well as it usually does. My granddad sat in front of his TV in his recliner and responded with two word sentences whenever we tried to socialize with him. On our second day there, I had pretty much had it. Between being stuck in a car with them for 10 hours and sleeping together on air mattresses in the basement, I needed some fresh air from my family. My granddad lives in a very small neighborhood, maybe five houses including his, and the rest is just a vast expansion of people's farmland. The nearest grocery store was a 25 minute drive away, so when I say he lives in the middle of nowhere, he quite literally lives in the middle of nowhere. The silver lining to this is it's extremely quiet and offers some of the best walks or runs you can have if you pop your headphones in and run alongside the fields. Bored out of my mind and with nothing else to do, I packed three water bottles, my favorite trail mix, and my extra phone battery before setting off for a mini exploring adventure. My granddad inherited a lot of land himself, but it's actually not directly connected to where his house is. We had only driven by it once, on the way to my grandma's funeral, and I decided that I wanted to walk to it and look around. It was after dinner when I left, and by the time that I got there, the sun was beginning to set. There was a tiny waist level fence going on into the distance, but I just climbed over it and began looking around. A truck was parked opposite the road to where the plot was, but I thought little of it because I figured that maybe somebody else's land was nearby or something. This is embarrassing to say as a 20 year old as well, but the level of privacy and peacefulness I felt sitting in some soybean field after being crammed in that house with my family felt amazing. I continued walking around though and eventually had to take my phone flashlight out because it was starting to get darker at this point. I started to get a little bit lost too and with it being night time I figured that I should start heading back. On my way back my foot hit something on the ground and I almost fell face first onto the dirt. I got up pointing my flashlight at the ground confused at what I saw. When I realized what it was though I put my hands on my knees and I started dry heaving over the ground. It was a dead animal or should I say animals but they were like combined. It was a dead rabbit but someone had stitched what looked like the bottom of a deer's leg under it and some sort of mutilated wings were sewn onto the lower back part of it. Lying next to it was what I think was another rabbit but it was honestly so torn up I couldn't really tell. It was also partially wrapped up in what looked like plastic wrap like the kitchen kind. I tried to keep it together but I ended up spilling my guts all over my shoes. My disgust turned to fear too when I heard crunching and someone calling out a name in the distance. They said Curtis. I felt like I had just got shot up with meth because I knew damn well nobody was supposed to be on my granddad's private property after dark, especially near those dead animals in the middle of nowhere. I had so much adrenaline pumping through my body that I ran faster than I even knew I could, exiting out of the field and running down the road. The truck was still there while I was running and I thought of trying to snap a picture of the license plate but they had some sort of covering over them. By the time that I got home I was out of breath and freaking out so my granddad and dad asked me what happened. I told him that there were people on this property on the farmland and said that we should call the police but he waved me off saying that it would take them 20 minutes to get there anyway and they would probably be gone already. I didn't tell them about the animals because, in all honesty, I mean, would you believe that? 
but I did decide that tomorrow I would show my dad so they knew that I saw what I saw. The next morning I said that we should really make sure that they were gone and so we drove off to look. We took my granddad's shotgun with us and when we got there, surprise surprise, the truck was now gone. But my hope shot up though when there were tiny flecks of blood leading into the field in the direction of where I tripped over the animals. We followed it to the small opening in the field and laying there was a single intact squirrel with its belly cut next to a pile of my vomit. The things that I saw though were now moved. At that point I knew that telling my dad what I saw was pretty much pointless because he would think that it was just the squirrel and I was just scared. In fact he actually laughed at me when I said that I was the one who vomited. He said that the people last night were probably just some kids trespassing and we went back home without speaking about it ever again. To this day, I'm still deeply unsettled and disturbed by what I saw that night. I don't know why someone did that to those animals and I don't even want to know what it was for. What almost frightens me even more though than the animals is the fact that I wasn't alone that night in the field. I only know that two people were there but the truck that they had could have at least held four, maybe even eight if people hopped in the back bed of the truck. All I know is that I'm glad that I didn't have to find out, but I really want to say that it was some kind of cult ritual offering or something, but I read in a psych or sociology paper that that's not an actual thing that happens. At the same time though, I mean, what else could it have been? Either way, I'll never be able to get the image out of my head and I just pray to God whoever did it never runs into another person in a field at night and gets caught. So about a, a year and a half ago, I was 16 and I'd taken a job as babysitting my aunt's dog in the Bronx while she was away on business. I don't exactly know the breed, but this dog was a powerhouse, more than capable of taking someone down. Her name is Dolly. I had to introduce myself to her in my aunt's presence to ensure that she knew who I was before showing up alone later, and I was told to walk her about four times a day. She's very well trained, doesn't bark really, which was what makes this encounter more creepy. You see, it was late, like 2am, and she adorably woke me up for a walk by digging her nose into my arm. When we began our walk, it was really dark out. You wouldn't be able to see anyone's face from a few feet away. The streets were empty, but that's expected at 2am. In this suburban kind of area in the Bronx, the sidewalks are very narrow. You can't walk down them in twos. Dolly was slow because she liked to smell literally every molecule on the sidewalk. But there was a man who was walking down the same sidewalk as us, maybe about 10 feet behind us. Dolly went off the sidewalk to where the grass was to sniff a tree. I knew with her that it could take years to be done with so much, so I kind of signaled the man who was a lot closer now to go on by, and I stepped off the narrow sidewalk onto the grass. And I was right. Dolly took forever sniffing this tree. I mean, I genuinely think it was about 10 to 15 minutes. I didn't have a problem with it taking long, being that I was listening to good music with AirPods and watching her go around this tree was an enjoyable sight. But then, all of a sudden, Dolly begins barking ferociously at something behind me. It really startled me too, because it was so abrupt and I had never seen her bark like that. I quickly turned around to see what would make her do this, and there was that same man. He hadn't gone any more forward in the direction that he was coming in since I signaled him to pass me, still about five feet away. He was on his phone. He was standing there just looking at me. Dolly, though, was going crazy at him, and he had little to no reaction. And now that I got a closer look at him, he was really tall, taller than me, and I'm 6'3". He was bald and his face was expressionless, although half of it was covered by the darkness of the night. I realized that the dude must have stood there staring at me for maybe 10 to 15 minutes now. He definitely wasn't trying to talk to me in that time because my music wasn't that loud and I would have heard him, and I don't think he was admiring the dog because even with her barking his eyes were zoned on me. 
We had about maybe a 10 second moment of staring at each other in the face. And normally I would have asked him if he needed something, but I just had the worst feeling. He right away reminded me of dancing tall smiley man creepypasta story, which I think was the cause of my fear for the moment. I turned from him and I felt safe with the ginormous dog next to me. I took my airpods out of my ears so that I could hear if he followed. Dolly walked with me but her eyes stayed on him the whole time. And instead of continuing down the same street, I crossed the block and as I started to do this, I kid you not that this man absolutely sprinted in the opposite direction that he was originally heading in. The sound of his feet rapidly hitting the floor sent an uppercut to my guts. I quickly turned around and watched him do this. He ran as if his life depended on it. I watched him run until he turned the corner and was out of view. I held Dolly's leash tight and hurried back to the house. I don't think he followed but Dolly kept looking back and growling and when we got back I locked the door and made sure Dolly slept in bed with me. To be honest I don't know what the heck was going on that night but the whole thing was just really weird. Several years back, I was cleaning out my house. I was renting a house for a year and the year was almost up at this point. I wasn't going to be living there the next year, so it was time for me to start cleaning out and moving my stuff out to my next place. The house that I had at the time was fairly small, but it was plenty of space for just me. I lived there by myself and I just finished cleaning out the living room, other than some basic furniture, and I had moved on to clean the kitchen. There were quite a few cabinets here, so many that I didn't use a good number of them. I was looking through some of the ones that I didn't use to make sure that there was nothing that I had in them, and one of them opened up and I saw something in the back corner. It looked like some type of shirt or rag or something, so I grabbed it and saw that I didn't think that it was mine, but when I moved it, it revealed a, a smaller white lever that I could barely see. The cabinet was in the corner, sort of by the sink and halfway blocked by the stove. I thought that it was just another pipe to be honest at first, but it just looked like a little different to me I guess. I got inside and had to crawl inside the cabinet, which was pretty large. Once I got inside, I saw that there was a small trapdoor to the side, leading into the wall. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, I mean, you had to be completely inside in order to see the detail of it. and. I decided to open the door which led to an extremely narrow hallway with a sort of crawl space. But when I got further inside I was completely horrified because I saw that there was food as well as several blankets as if someone had been living inside of there the whole time. The good news, at least to me, is that whoever was in there was gone. I tried to make sense of it and figure out how long the person had been there and how I didn't know about this. I was gone from the house a lot with work and other stuff, but I just didn't know how it was possible for someone to live in there without me knowing. I continued cleaning until it got pretty late and the next day after work I continued. I was still kind of in shock with finding a secret room in my house and I decided to look at it once again. I opened the cabinet and went inside, then I pulled the lever open just like I had the previous day. But this time, as soon as I opened it, I saw movement and then saw a person for a split second. They slammed the door back shut on me and I immediately turned and ran all the way out of my house to my car and then called the police. I was so scared that I started driving away as well and I told the police the whole situation and they came to my house a short time later to find that whoever had been there was now gone. Luckily for me I moved out the next week but I really don't know how long the person had been living in a secret room like that. Thankfully, it never gave me a problem, but still, I potentially had been living in a house with another person that I didn't even know for quite some time. So I've lurked here and commented before and I've been asked to share some stories as well. For some background, I worked as a cop for several years before becoming a ranger. 
I've been a ranger in a large US national park for a while now and I have some things that uh, I'll never forget. Creepy things and things that show the brutality and hatred humans are capable of. So uh, I was on night shift. I patrolled the park looking for any type of illegal activity like drug use, prostitution, poaching. I got a call for a man looking into a cabin where a summer camp was going on. So, great, probably some creep just hassling some kids. I blacked out, no headlights or sirens, parked a little ways down and walked in hopes of catching this guy. And, sure as heck, homie was looking in windows. I start my approach and flick on my flashlight and told him not to move and showed me his hands. He turns around and looks at me and starts saying that he's sorry. I put him in handcuffs and detained him while I searched him and waited for backup. I found his ID, a knife and some miscellaneous things. I put him into another officer's vehicle while I made contact with the counsellors. They stated that they had seen him earlier in the day but thought nothing of it. After taking statements, I run his name. And yep, he's a registered sex offender. I opened the door to talk to him and not my proudest moment but I was tired. He was looking at little kids and I said, What do you think you were going to do, you sick weirdo? And he looked me in my eyes, no reaction, and said to me in a cold monotone voice, I was able to smell them. They're ready to breed, officer. I didn't know what to say to that, so I just closed the door. I stayed on the scene for the rest of the night to ease everyone's mind and act as a deterrent. Obviously, he ended up being charged, but thinking about what he said and the way that he said it still makes me feel sick. He's now banned and I believe still in prison, where I believe creeps like him should stay forever, but he ruined a great outdoor experience and may have scarred these poor kids from camping, hiking, fishing or hunting and just enjoying the outdoors for life. I could go on about some of the awful people and stuff that I've heard, seen, and even responded to, but cases involving children in any way, they are just the worst. I was born and grew up in a town called Shrewsbury in Shropshire, England. The town has a reputation of being one of the most haunted places in the world. The town is well over a thousand years old. A lot of the ruins of the old buildings remain, even in the town center. Everyone I know growing up had some sort of an experience, haunted or otherwise, at some point in their lives there too. So, getting to my most haunted experience that spans a number of years, these aren't my only experiences, but this is the one that has affected me the most. My grandparents have a house in the Bellevue area of the town that all of the family, my mother and her siblings, grew up in. This house has a back bedroom that gives off a vibe that you just don't want to mess with. It's the only room in the house that has the door always closed and is now used as a storeroom that my nan refuses to enter alone. It was used when I was a kid as a spare bedroom for when me and my brother would stay over, but we hated being in that room. One night though, me and my brother were asleep in there and I woke up just in time to look over to see the light fixture on the ceiling next to my bed. I can even remember the feeling of the cold plaster touching my cheek right before whatever the heck was lifting me let me go. I hit the mattress and immediately started screaming, obviously, and my dad burst into the room to find out what happened. I told him everything but he was obviously very skeptical. But I even remember him saying that the room was very cold, even though the heating was on, and there was an odd feeling that he couldn't explain. My brother, who was asleep during my incident, said that he had a dream that night of an old man standing over him shouting for him to get out, and to this day he's reluctant to talk about it because of how real it felt. Now, this is where it starts to get worse, because I was told this was like over a month after the first incident, but... I was at home in my house, the other side of the town, and it happened again. Me and my brother at this time used bunk beds and I slept on the top bunk. My dad was downstairs watching TV and all of a sudden he said that he got a feeling that something was wrong, then realized the 
feeling that he felt was the same as it was when I had the incident at my nats. He ran upstairs, burst into the room, just in time to catch me falling from the ceiling. I had apparently been picked up, lifted over the bed's safety rail, and was hanging with my head tilted towards the ground, and my dad burst in to see me hanging there in midair for a split second before dropping, and he actually caught me just in time. He was terrified and could never explain what happened, and nothing ever happened again. Until I was in my mid-twenties, that is. My nan was heading out somewhere for an overnight stay, so I said that I would stay the night, feed the dogs and sleep on the sofa and whatnot. I did everything stated, went to sleep on the sofa, but woke up in the morning in the spare room, at the back of the room behind a load of storage boxes. It took me five minutes of moving the boxes out of my way to reach the door to actually get out, and to this day, now 14 years later, I still have no idea how the heck I got into that room, over those boxes and to the back section of the room without damaging anything. I've never been more confused and frightened after waking up in all my life and I've never stayed another night in that house since then. But my nan refuses to talk about that room. My granddad was the same prior to his death. I have no idea what happened in that house, what well, spirit or worse or whatever it is, is living back in that back room. But I'll never go back in that room for as long as I live.